from 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. to enable installation of signage on their building's exterior, as well as close that portion of the sidewalk over which a truck lift will be situated on Main Street from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. and on North Pleasant Street from 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. as shown on the Google map attached to the application. Second. Further discussion, Ms. Brewer. Um, I, I imagine this has taken place since then, but I had a conversation with Deborah Roussel in town manager's office to ask her to make clear to this company that there, if they had a rain problem or a truck problem that day, that they could not come back the next day because the next day will be graduation at UMass. So we did not need to tie up any traffic on that day. One assumes everything will go beautifully for them on Thursday, but if they have some weird circumstance, they'll come back to us for another date. One of the attorneys from this law firm was in fact at our party That's previously, right. and I <laughs> went over that, that point with him. Yes, right. so we're all very clear, has to happen on the 9th. Right. Okay, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, that is unanimous. Uh, let's do some taxi licenses. I move that the select board approve a new 2013 taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Wanajiku J. Magua of Amherst on behalf of Gotta Go Taxi Company. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. that's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a new 2013 taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Paul Benoit of Belchertown on behalf of Aaron's Paradise. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a new 2013 taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Yusef Awad of Amherst MA on behalf of Ambassador Taxi. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Uh, we have a common vitulers license. This did not make the agenda. This is under topics not anticipated 48 hours before the meeting. This is a uh, common vitulers license for Hickory Ridge. They had previously had their common vic renewed with our annual renewals, but they now need to make a change to the time. So this is just an alteration of that license. Ms. Stein. I move that the select board amend the common <coughs> vitulers license for Hickory Ridge Grill LLC from in season 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily to year round, Monday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 12 a.m. daily. Second. Further discussion? Oh, Ms. Brewer. And just again, for the audience's benefit, we know that the chief of police and everyone else is okay with this or we wouldn't have gotten it. So mm -hmm. that's why we know it's all right. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. How about special licenses? I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license to Judy Bardwell on behalf of Top of the Campus Incorporated for receptions on various dates and locations on the UMass Amherst campus, Judy Bardwell clerk as follows. April 26th, 2013 at Memorial Hall from 5 to 7 p.m. And as you can see, that date has passed, but it's a catch up for us. May 7th, 2013, at Eisenberg School of Management Atrium from 4 to 6 p.m. May 7th, 2013, at Durfee Gardens from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. That was May 10th. May 10th. May 10th. Yep. Did I say May something else? <coughs> yes. Sorry, okay. May 10th. We knew what you meant. Okay. Well, is there one more? And then the last one's canceled. The last one is canceled Separate because oh, it's, a different, it's a different... Oh, um, <coughs> And look All at right. the actual Answer. things. Second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 aye, that's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license to Brenda Ryan Newton on behalf of Top of the Campus Incorporated for a reception on May 11th, 2013 at Durfee Gardens, UMass Amherst Campus from 3.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Brenda Ryan Newton, president. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. I can fit in the committee appointment if you wish. Yes, indeed. I move that the select board appoint John Tibbetts and Abby Getman to the Agricultural Commission, both with terms to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I just aye. will say one thing. John Tibbetts served once before on the Ag Commission with great distinction. They were sorry when he took 
could not stay on at that time and they're delighted to get him back. Very good. Okay, let's see. I think we're out of quick untimed items. So what else can we do? Um, does anybody have any announcements to make before we get to our timed items? Uh, we already announced the election. Ms. Brewer? I could, I could semi-announcement like the housing production plan that we have in our, in our program. <coughs> You haven't. Already, you might have read previous versions of it. There have been some changes to it, um, and the PowerPoint that you may have seen referenced separately on the website for the Housing and Sheltering Committee is also attached to this. There's going to be a memo in our next packet, the packet for the first night of town meeting, the packet for, the packet for our meeting on May 6th, that will explain that the select board has to take action on the housing production plan just as the planning board is planning to do this week. So we'll get the cover memo that explains what our role is in this um, for our next packet so that we can go over this on the night of the first meeting of town meeting. Thank you very much. And Amherst Media, the sound in here is fantastic right now. Thank you very much. Ms. Stein. Um, I can announce that the police station is again taking drugs. <coughs> Um, did have a successful, I think, drug drive on Wildwood at, on Saturday. Um, but now, again, if you missed that, feel free to drop off drugs at the police station. And um, I could mention a word about the vote for tomorrow if people don't know what's happening. It's, there are two Democrats running, Markey and Lynch. There are three Republicans running. Gomez, um, Winslow, and blanking, Sullivan. And so what the vote is very simple. If you're a Republican, you choose one of those three. If you're a Democrat, you choose one of those two. But it does help, so it's good to go out and vote. Thank you. And uh, however, the primary works out, the, uh, the actual election for that seat will be uh, June 25th, is that correct? Yep. June 25th. 25th, yeah. Very good. All right, that's taken us exactly to 6.45. So we are ready for our first timed item, which is uh, Business Improvement District. We have Alex Crograbe here to talk to us about a very exciting development downtown. Alex Crograbe, Executive Director of the Amherst Business Improvement District. Uh, thank you for having us here on relatively short notice. I just wanted to inform the select board and the public about a big initiative of the bid that is about to launch. Uh, when we started up the bid, uh, we heard a lot that students would come downtown if it were easier for them to do so. And the product of those recommendations, as well as the models of some other communities, uh, was the purchase of two trolleys. Um, that we think will add a lot of atmosphere and fun to downtown, as well as a, uh, a great way to get between UMass campus and downtown. These are not trolleys on rails or on wires, but on wheels like a bus, but they look like a trolley. Um, a fixed route is intended to start in the fall between downtown and UMass's campus. The details of that route we're still working out. Uh, the trolleys will also be used for special event shuttles, uh, including events like the block party that the bid organizes in September, running shuttles to satellite parking lots for events like that, um, as well as a presence at other events. And in fact, we are intending to launch the trolley service for special event shuttles this weekend for the ultimate Frisbee tournament at the high school, uh, going between the field locations at university and at the high school as well as downtown and of course we have been in consultation with the town manager and UMass Transit who operates the PVTA transit service as well as DPW and the police department have a meeting tomorrow at 1030 with the police chief to discuss their input on the trolleys um, currently they're being stored down at Barry Roberts' property down in South Amherst. Barry Roberts and Jerry Jolly, the president and vice president of the BIDS board of directors, are here tonight as well. Uh, and yeah, so if there's any, anything the select board or the public would like to know about the trolleys, feel free to be in touch with me on the, um, the BIDS website. There's information about the trolleys as well. So 
Thank you. Questions or comments from Select Board? Ms. Stein. I think it sounds like a lot of fun. Does it have a bell? I believe they do. <laughs> Both have bells, yep. Better yet. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Ms. Brewer. I remember seeing such an item, though many years ago, when we first, actually only 15 years ago, when we moved to Amherst, and I was sorry that it didn't work out as a permanent thing, so I'm really excited to see you bring this back. I think having something that just looks different <coughs> than the PVTA buses, in addition to the fixed route, it, it really adds a lot to the charm as well as the convenience, so thank you all for working on this. And I would also add that this is certainly viewed as a supplement, not a replacement of PVTA right. service, and we'll... Uh, connect as much as possible to PVTA service. Great. Thank you. Mr. Wald. Could you explain to the public the price for the <laughs> user? Uh, oh, uh, thank you very much. Um, they'll also be free. <laughs> and you don't have to be a student necessarily to ride it. Presumably. They're for everyone. Yep. Terrific. Uh, anything else folks want to know, need to know about the trolleys? So you said they get started this weekend, then we'll see them more regularly in the fall? Yeah, so again, we'll be running them for special events as they come up over the summer, starting this weekend, and then in the fall, yes, the fixed route will start. Terrific. Oh, that is uh, another, another concrete and wonderful sign of what the bid has brought to downtown. Um, we've had a bunch of fantastic street performances lately that has really added to the energy downtown uh, in these past few lovely weekends. There's going to be more of that. Um, soon we'll have the flower baskets coming. That will be very exciting. That will be incredibly beautiful. We obviously had the wonderful block party last September, for which another one is planned for the 12th of September. Is that right? Correct. So mark your calendars for uh, the, the second annual community block party. Um, and the cleanup efforts, I mean, really, the, the, the bid has been in existence for a very short time, but has already made a, a, a very concrete difference. And, uh, and it's really appreciated by folks. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I would add that. Um, any more information about this stuff can be found at the BIDS website, which is amherstdowntown.com. Thank you. And uh, to anyone who hasn't signed up for their uh, email mm -hmm. updates, every Monday they send a very useful, very uh, informative, detailed update about what the BID is and up succinct. to. So thank you. Ms. I Stein. just wanted to say those are great emails, and you get a sense of vibrancy that's really nice. So thank you for them. Thank you. Thank you for coming in tonight. Look forward to the trolleys. All right, our 650 item is uh, a farmer winery license application. Do we have the applicant here for that? Hello, please come forward. And if you could introduce yourself for folks at home. My name is Gary Kamen. I'm the owner and operator of Mount Warner Vineyards, a Pioneer Valley vineyard and winery. Wonderful, welcome, thank you for coming. So this is a special kind of a liquor license um, that uh, the state has actually just passed a new regulation for uh, regarding, which is why we set the fee for this that the last meeting or two meetings ago for $50. This is for um, farmer wineries to sell alcohol at um, agricultural events. So you're looking to be set up at the Saturday farmer's market downtown? That is correct. Um, and what else would you like us to know about that? Um, we've uh, submitted the appropriate uh, materials to uh, MDAR. They've approved our application. We've uh, been approved by the uh, Amherst Farmers Market. Uh, we have all the necessary licensing materials, and um, we think we're uh, we have the uh, TIP certification, uh, and uh, we think we're uh, fully um, willing and able and looking forward to participating in the Saturday morning Amherst Farmers Market. Terrific. Thank you. Mr. Hayden and Ms. Thank Burke. you for saying that out loud. We knew all of that because of the huge piece of paperwork that we got from that. Um, I was hoping, though, you might tell us about stuff that we don't have in our packet. What kind of wines will there be there? We uh, make both red and white wines. We make uh, port-style wines. Uh, we make uh, dry and off-dry wines. Uh, we'll be offering these wines for sale at the farmer's market. We'll also be uh, presenting uh, uh, promotional materials in the event that individuals would like to visit uh, our winery and vineyard for a tour and tasting. We can offer that at the, at the winery. Um, and um, we, uh, we hope to be um, representing uh, a, a diverse segment of uh, local agriculture. 
Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. I just wanted to ask that we clarify whether or not there were tastings at the farmer's market itself. We will be doing tastings at the farmer's market. Uh, the uh, legislation allows for the tasting of up to uh, five uh, one-ounce pours of wine. Uh, we, we're, we're expecting to be pouring uh, up to two wines uh, each week that we will be at the market. And again, that would be a maximum of uh, uh, one ounce of tasting. Wonderful. Other questions or comments for Mr. Kamen? Um, so you mentioned the TIP certification, so all the folks that will be there working with you or for you um, are familiar with the challenges of the potential for underage service. That is correct, and we're too. fully prepared and certified, trained in uh, identifying individuals who are eligible and eligible for tasting wine. Great. Other questions or comments? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board approve the application of the Mount Warner Vineyards LLC of Hadley MA for a license to sell wine products produced by or on their behalf in sealed containers for off-premise cons consumption at the Amherst Farmers Market in the Spring Street parking lot on Saturdays, May 4th, 2013 through November 23rd, 2013, from 7.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., pursuant to Chapter 138, Section 15F of the Massachusetts General Laws, Gary Kamen, Owner-Manager. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Good luck. Thank you very much. And further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You think you're going to be there starting this Saturday? Uh, we're hoping to be there starting this Saturday. We've been, uh, we've been uh, selected as a part-time vendor. As you know, it is a bit competitive at the Saturday morning <laughs> market. Uh, but we're expecting uh, that we may well be there uh, this Saturday. We'll Terrific. know uh, by midweek. That's great. Well, we wish you the very best of luck, and thank you for coming in tonight. Thanks so very much. Take care. All right, we've got a couple of minutes before we get to our 7 o'clock item, and we're out of untimed items. Did anybody have any other announcements that they wanted to make? Any kind of information to share right now? All right, um, let's see. Well, maybe we can deal with the select board logistics for town meeting, um, because this is fairly quick. So obviously, town meeting starts next week. Uh, the select board is set to meet Mondays and Wednesdays during that. Um, and what has been our practice lately is basically to schedule all of those meetings uh, because we need to post them and then to plan to meet on the Monday evenings of that and then decide to meet on the Wednesday for the Wednesday meeting only as needed. Um, so unless anybody had any issues with that, that's what we would try and do again. Um, we do already have, as Ms. Brewer already alluded to, the plan to talk about the housing production plan next Monday, so that is a big topic for us to uh, pick up at that point, which brings us to the question of what time do we meet? So town meeting now starts at 7 o'clock. It used to start at 7.30. We had, uh, and, and when it started at 7.30, we met at 6.30. Um, we tried to split the difference in the fall and meet at 6.15. Um, I'm concerned that on nights we need to meet, that that just might not give us enough time. So I'm wondering how people feel about starting at 6 o'clock. Ms. Brewer. Well, I'll volunteer since we all know how timely I always am. And I <laughs> am horrified by the idea of meeting at 6, but also realize it's probably what we need to do because 6.15 is just kind of pushing it. And I certainly did, in fact, tell the Housing and Sheltering Committee that we'd be meeting at 6 on Monday the 6th. So I'm... I'm in if everybody else can do it. Maybe we should just plan to meet at 5.55. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> I think that would work. Don't push it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hayden. Can we bring a sandwich? A sa absolutely. <laughs> there will be much eating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So 6 o'clock. All right. So we're good for planning on the Mondays. Wednesdays as necessary, starting at six o'clock. The other thing we usually review is um, that 
as has been our practice the last uh, few years, um, that we're trying to say as little as is necessary for <laughs> speaking to positions on warrant articles, uh, in particular when we follow the Finance Committee. Obviously, if it's the Select Board's article and we're doing the whole presentation, making the motion, then that's a different, but um, it has been our practice lately to sort of say, yeah, what they said, <laughs> unless there's uh, obviously Select Board uh, additional details that we want to add anything that was missed but um and i i say this not to stifle people i say this to um uh, to remind us that we don't always have to create a three-minute explanation for all of these articles and uh, as town meeting gets closer and, and things get very busy sometimes just having that reminder is kind of a relief <laughs> so um, are there any other questions about the logistics of town meeting and how select board deals with it that anyone wants to talk about now um, we will be doing again, uh, and I've talked with Jim Pastrang, the new moderator, about um, that change that we made during fall town meeting also about um, making the motion for the next article every night and letting the body decide whether or not they want to um, do that at 10 o'clock. And um, so we talked about how to do that in a way that makes it nice and clear to the body that it is their their opportunity um, to speak to, in particular, whether they want or don't want um, the the meeting to continue. So uh, so that's just an, a, another tweak that we instituted recently that we're going to try and keep going with. Um, this is also a good time to remind town meeting members out there that town meeting does, in fact, start at 7 o'clock again, just like we did in the fall. We are uh, we are continuing that. This will be the first time we do it in the spring. I think the time that we have a 45 article warrant is a really good time to have that extra half an hour. So uh, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, hope that people can be prompt and we can get our business done as quickly as possible. Mr. Hayden. Uh, while we're speaking about town meeting, um, I think town meeting members probably know by now that there's a consent calendar, which I'm looking forward to. There's seven, seven articles on that, uh, another innovation. That, is another good innovation for a 45 article. Yes, um, absolutely. So the, uh, the moderator will talk about that the first night of town meeting. Uh, if five members want to take anything off the consent calendar, then they can do that. But otherwise, that might be a way to get through a handful of articles pretty quickly. So select board members who are speaking to any of those just might pay attention to the fact that you may or may not need to speak to those depending on uh, how the vote for the consent calendar goes. So just uh, plan accordingly. All right, anything else about town meeting that um, we need to clarify? I assume that we're still in the music room, what do we call it, the band room, um, that we've been in lately, but I will confirm that. Um, so I will remember to check on that. Okay, so six o'clock. Monday, we will see you at the middle school. All right, so then it is seven o'clock and we are back to uh, taking uh, positions on the town meeting warrant articles. Tonight we have a bunch of more articles. The, this should finish up our warrant positions tonight. Um, and we are starting with article 37, PVTA funding. Hi. Welcome. Hi, Thank you. Just uh, if you could introduce yourself again for folks at home. Hi there. Um, my name is Helen Berg, B-E-R-G, and I was the volunteer that collected the statistics that enabled the Survival Center to move from its uh, old facility in the North Amherst School, um, where it had, had been since uh, 1975, um, without the knowledge that a new facility was planned. and. About 50 people have been essentially left behind as a result. Um, so I uh, took out a citizen's position, uh, petition, um, which I don't believe that uh, all the town meeting members have actually received yet. However, um, I have a couple of legal women voters that's on the petition, um, Adrian Terezi and Elaine Bodich. Um, I also have the center director, Cheryl Zoll, um, a longtime volunteer, Sarah Fisher. Um, several people that um, are strong members of the community, I would say, Heather Hornick, and even Nelson Valley, who was a, um, a Puerto Rican um, baseball star for the Detroit Tigers, who now lives in Amherst and who I've known for a long time. So, 
Um, I would say, and somebody like Sonia, um, I back in, uh, back that lives in uh, Ann Whalen and has for some time. Um, a woman that is in poverty and who I haven't seen since the facility went up. And I have been there. Um, so I brought a map, because that's what I was told to do. I don't think it's up yet. I don't know why, because I did initially submit an article by Nick Grabe um, that quotes um, the town manager Masante as, as uh, announcing that this um, kind of run would cost about $28,000, which is what I based the petition on, um, as well as um, I added 2004 bus stop. So this is an annual request. Um, shall I read the petition? Um, no, that's okay. We all have the warrant. And okay, so great. We are familiar all with right. It. So anyway, um, my here's the map. And uh, basically, what would happen is that in the old North Amherst school basement, which was really quite adequate, and this style took us quite by surprise. We were actually given the option when we asked about a bus to sign a petition that said we supported the facility, and many of us didn't because it's not on a bus route. Um, right now, there's only taxi service once a week, Tuesday, well, four times on Tuesdays. They're open four days a week. The long day is Thursday from 11 to 7. And the taxi service starts at 11.30, so these people will miss automatically out on the food distribution which they do at 11 o'clock. Uh, I volunteered there for almost two years, 25 hours a week, four days a week. Anyway, the map, which is of North Amherst, um, if we start at the Congregational Church and where the old um, a schoolhouse basement is, which has a daycare center above, and where the old Amherst Survival Center, of which I have this beautiful picture, um, it was really nice. It was really a usable space, and there wasn't such a buffer between the people that are the staff and the patrons, whom they refer to as clients. Um, that's a term that I find a little offensive. I prefer to think of myself as a patron. A lot of people eat there that don't need to eat there. Anyway, the map, I think we would go northbound up Montague Road, right onto Cowles Lane, um, left onto um, Sunderland Road, and we would put a bus stop right in front of the Amherst Survival Center. So it would be just going one way, that spur. And um, the people in th that needed to make a return trip, no doubt, would have to continue onto Sunderland direction and, and transfer a townhouse apartments rather than the old North Pleasant Street stop. But in this way, the development that's already begun um, at the old Coles Lumber Plant, uh, basically the, the building's raised. Uh, Cinda Jones has made it pretty clear uh, in the press that she intends to go ahead with mixed-use commercial student dwellings. And that way, I'm only calling right now for four buses a day that the Survival Center is open, which is four days a week. So four times four. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is the, the bus route. I'm going to leave this here if anyone is interested. This is the capital ca campaign and people that were on it. And I want to say that all donations over $1,000 were matched by an anonymous donor who a lot of the members of the community know who he is. And the people that are patrons do not. And it does create resentment. Okay. Um, I would also, no, no, I'm sorry, but I do have to mention that not only is this picture that Nick Grabe wrote, along with the article quoting Mr. Musante and Ms. Zoll, um, it is um, uh, on the back is another petition I did uh, with people that are not voters of Amherst, but the one I brought here tonight is, and in fact, stamped and dated. March 5th, um, and I just want to dedicate my presentation to um, David Goodnow, who was known as Grandpa, who died on March 
uh, sorry, April 5th, one month after I got this petition in, and I had to scramble because I attempted to work with the Survival Center and the town on this, the Survival Center. I don't know if they've pulled this off their website yet, their objection, but I am willing to work with people, and if this will help Cindy Jones along with her um, zoning issues, um, I'm all for it. Thank you very much, Ms. Bird. Appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Bird? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, this petition is extremely well-meaning. The, the need for folks to be able to get to the survival center to uh, partake of the services is real. Um, the, the town has uh, spent a lot of money trying to improve the sidewalks there to, to help improve that situation. I know that the PBTA has continued to talk about what is the best solution to this problem. Um, and, and I'll let Mr. Musanti speak about that, but, mm -hmm. but there are solutions to be found going forward. Um, I don't believe that this petition is the right solution at this time. I think that that's a very large amount of money to imagine the town committing every year um, for this purpose, but I appreciate Ms. Berg bringing attention to this need because it is a need and, and we need to find a solution and I hope that a, uh, a very good one can be found. Mr. Musanti, anything you'd like to say from the PVTA perspective as chair of that board? Um, yeah, and I've, I've talked about uh, the needs to service the survival center with uh, uh, survival center staff and with uh, the PVTA staff and uh, as an alternative to uh, what over a, a you know over a uh, ten year period would would cost the community upwards of three hundred thousand dollars to do this limited additional spur service. Uh, there might be much more cost effective alternatives uh, in terms of more flexible transportation options that the survival center itself could pursue, and I'm willing to and have offered to try to facilitate facilitate that with the PVTA, and PVTA is very receptive, but, um, and the Survival Center wants to work with us on that. Th they have said uh, they don't consider this particular route a viable option at the present time. Thank you. Uh, hold on. Questions or comments from Select Board? Ms. Brewer. Um, I'm fiddling around looking for that orange sheet of paper we got before, but I can't seem to put my hand on it. Um, in the meantime, I know this is something we certainly talked about when we knew that the survival center was moving and this concern was raised and we said we hope we can run a bus up to there and although it's disappointing that that hasn't happened yet uh, it still feels as though it belongs more in the area of PVTA working out how to do this more appropriately than attempting to do it this way although I can certainly appreciate the frustration that it's the survival centers there and the bus stop isn't that is that is very hard and um, the taxi service is at least some slight mitigation associated with that but we definitely don't want to lose sight of this even though we may not support this article thank you other questions or comments mr. Hayden well, I, I'm I'm sorry that I have to ask this question I should know the answer to it but um, the public transportation and bicycle committee spent a lot of time and effort working on this I was at a number of meetings where um, they were working very hard with their PVTA liaison. Um, what's the upshot? <laughs> Is there one? Have they have they come forward? With uh, PVTA and UMass Transit were asked to do a, uh, a service analysis, which was the basis for that cost estimate. Um, and the lion's share of ridership uh, is, you know, from Sunderland and then through uh, uh, Meadow Street on the townhouse side. So. Um, for substantially fewer dollars, we think there are alternatives to a fixed route service that might uh, service the survival center without the you know recurring costs that a that a fixed route service. And so, um, we've encouraged the survival center to uh, pursue that, and I'm offered to help facilitate that. So they're they're actively exploring that. I think that's a more viable option. Thank you. I'll note that I was uh, on the Survival Center board for many years, quite a long time ago, and uh, and uh, so that place is near and dear to my heart. Um, and among the things that is important to note about the Survival Center is that folks come from all over the place to use this. It is it is a 
a, a critical part of the infrastructure for folks from um, far beyond Amherst. And so I think that part of the thing to keep in mind is that Amherst can't be the full solution to this problem. There needs to be, um, it, there needs to be a conversation about resources and really what is the best way as a region for us to approach this because it really is a regional issue. It's the fact that it, the, the center is located in Amherst doesn't make um, this our sole responsibility to try and uh, fund the, the transportation in my opinion. So I think that that needs to be part of the solution going forward. Other questions or comments from folks? Ms. Burke, you come forward. You, you need to come forward, please. one of these but like I would like to point out an anonymous person facilitated this and there's a question about why that is not known to the people that have put so many hours of volunteer work in there people are now being the move was preempted by the stated date and people are now being deprived of food and company and isolation hurts people it hurts people a community of about 50. I know maybe two volunteers with cars, uh, and a lot of people have shown up there that I've never seen before. I've been going there since 2007. So a lot of men. It's not a safe environment. There is an indication that um, it's supposed to be family-oriented, but I question whether this building won't be flipped within three years Okay. given this is really kind of getting off the track well of the if i could just arc. ask you mrs o'keefe what solution do you see because i have attempted to work with people in this town for two years on this ever since i found out about its proposed existence and it did start off as a million dollar refurbishment not a 2.5 million dollar expenditure of which the building is only appraised at less than a million nine hundred eighty we've strayed beyond the petition well, article. if you could just go into what possible solutions if it we were easy we would have solved it a long time ago so the well, let me just say is tuesday is not enough Ms. if you're Bird, not serving the patrons you very much we're done with pe this petition article. okay if Appreciate you're not serving your the patrons there's still a vote it's not over till the fat lady sings Thank there you. are Ms. people Bird. that are being left behind every day by the fact that housing real estate is being snapped up in this town as demonstrated in the Gazette Ms. Bird, over the past I'm gonna, week. I'm going to recess this meeting if you uh, don't you step go. away from the mic. Thank you. All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Excuse me, I move that the select board not recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting Article 37 petition PBTA funding. And I might just say why. Um, I just have to wait. Thank you for the discussion. Go ahead. Um, partially because the survival center itself, as I recall, I don't have the orange sheet. We're both missing it. But um, felt that another solution could be worked out that would not be so costly for the town. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Hayden. Um, that, that is so. I mean, you, you remember correctly. Thank so. you. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Who's going to speak to that? Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Would anyone like to speak to that? I'll be happy to take that then. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Article 39, the petition for nuisance house. Ms. Pearl. And if you could identify yourself, please, for folks at home. I'm Melissa Perot, Precinct 1. And <clears throat> I'm here to um, inform you that I'm going to ask to dismiss the Article 39 on the town meeting floor um, for the following reasons. Um, the, dis the schedule of response costs developed by the police department will not act as an incentive to landlords to bring student behavior under control, as I had hoped. It's um, fairly minimal. Um, I also expected the response costs to be discussed in a public meeting of the select board, since they are named as the responsible for them in the bylaw, and that they would be developed, also, also that they would be developed in a timely manner before the petition article was due. Um, this, this was not the case. In these circumstances, the deletion of additional fire and ambulance in the response cost definition that I made was um, in an effort to simplify and avoid legal complications was perhaps misadvised since that would indeed 
make the um, response costs considerably heavier than the police department allowed. Um, so that's, that's the main reason uh, I learned about the um, response costs, um, not at a meeting, but because I was not there on that, on that day, I guess. But I gathered that uh, they came from you, Mr. Masanti? Yep. Yeah. And I thought they would be discussed, or at least there could be public comment at the um, select board, but they didn't occur that way. So um, there's not much point in making the recommendations and changes that I made to the um, Article 39. Um, 38, I got that wrong. Um, 39. The, the nuisance house by law. <laughs> um, and also, um, other things that have bothered me is that, that given the numerous complaints have been made against certain rental properties and the threshold of three notifications, has never been achieved to my knowledge, I think it'll be unlikely to do so in the future so these changes won't actually come into um, operation. Um, and the amendments that I've made will probably be irrelevant. And I think the police are right in making alcohol violations their priority. The third reason is that hopefully Article 29 or 38 will pass and begin to bring nuisance houses under control. And that this, it'll all be under one sort of package of uh, enforcement. And that's probably more efficient than what we've got now. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from select board? Um, I would just note that uh, the nuisance house bylaw does still need some tweaks to it. Um, and it was difficult to, uh, I had been working with Ms. Perot on, a, on some of these amendments uh, in the lead up to the warrant deadline. And because the Attorney General's office deals with the stuff that we had done at the last town meeting, they deal with it for months. We only just last week got back the zoning articles from them, the nuisance house article we just got back a couple weeks ago. Um, it, so it's actually incredibly difficult to try and work with an article twice in close um, proximity because you're not working with the cleaned up version. And so as part of the fact that you're not working with the cleaned up version, um, a number of sections were actually left out of the petition article. And so um, uh, Ms. Pro has her um, feelings about why to withdraw it, but um, I had indicated to her ahead of time that I was going to be recommending uh, dismissal because it just it isn't viable as it stands, and really it needs to be set aside, let uh, a clean copy be uh, tweaked for the future, but um, with, with all of the sections that it's missing currently, there's, it there doesn't give us really anything to work with. So um, I appreciate the sentiment behind it, and I hope that um, we can bring it forward in a cleaner form for the future. Um, and as far as the response costs go, that was discussed at a select board meeting. It was noticed under the town manager's report several weeks ago. We weren't discussing we weren't discussing the costs, whether they were right or not, because they're just the costs. It's what the, it's what the police chief decided were the costs, so it's not like we were setting um, different, uh, we were going to consider different limits than the costs. But anyway, just so folks know, we, we did talk about that, and it was on the agenda. Okay, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend dismissal. Um, for the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 39, Nuisance House Bylaw Amendment. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Would anyone like to speak to that? And I will speak to that. <laughs> okay. Article 40, Rental Housing Information. Anyone here to speak to that? No? Okay. So uh, this is. Um, Mr. Uh, O'Connor's petition, um, perhaps he'll come later, so we will hold that off. So uh, his is also Article 41, uh, unless anyone is here to speak to the residential parking petition. Okay, then 42 is the petition for affordability restriction at Echo Village Apartments. Please come forward.
Welcome. And please introduce yourself for folks at home. Hi, good evening. My name is Tracy Lee Boutillier, and I am um, part of the Echo Village Tenants Organization, um, and I'm here representing for um, the Tenants Organization and Article 42. Um, I brought some extra handouts that I wasn't able to get to you guys before that I used at the review, so I'd like to pass them around if I may. Thank you. So first, um, I guess I would like to describe where Echo Village is located for those that may not be aware. Um, we are located at the intersection of uh, Route 9, Old Amherst Road, Gatehouse Road, which is basically right before we get to Rolling Green as we're coming away from the center of town <coughs> in Amherst. Um, the building was... Um, sold uh, in between two private owners um, going from one hand to the next and in the with that sale uh, two buildings were purchased and the article um, will be amended to reflect the new approximate price um, total sale that we're looking at for the purchase of uh, one of the buildings the apartment building of 30 gatehouse road um, which has a 24 units apartments in it um, so the petition, we're requesting um, that the town acquire the property to preserve affordable housing and um, to see the total price will be, if I'm thinking correctly, sorry, uh, $2.55 million versus the $3 million that's um, written in the petition. So I will need to uh, amend that when we get to town meeting. Um, with 85% of that coming through fun other funding sources, um, gifts, bequests, grants, loans from the um, government and the state, and 15% of that we're asking to come uh, through the town. That will come out to about $400,000 or less. And the through some of the research we're, um, that I've been doing and we've been working on together as tenants, we're finding that um, the property basically qualifies um, for some of some state funds um, and loan programs, one being the low income um, housing tax credit at a 4% um, tax credit, and also the affordable housing trust fund and home funds. Um, these are sources that we could look at using uh, to go get towards the 85% that would go towards the 85%. Um, there, you know, some, um, we're also looking at getting to the CPA committee and requesting support through that. Um, still in the process, we've kind of missed uh, some meetings. They've been canceled and we're waiting for some rescheduling. Um, the building has 24 units in it. There are 10 uh, two-bedroom units with um, a bath. One of those units is fully handicap accessible. Um, there are seven three-bedroom units with two baths and seven four-bedroom units with two baths um, as well, and one of those being handicap accessible. We see the benefit to the town um, in acquiring the property as having that property then um, come into, by deed restriction, um, come into the count that builds towards the affordability um, percentage that goes along with the 40B, if I'm explaining that. Um, right now, because there aren't deed restrictions and there aren't public funds coming into the property, we do not count um, in that, uh, those numbers that, that go towards the affordability percentage. With the acquisition, um, we could, by having the deed restrictions put on the property, then count. 
So this is a way that the town could increase the amount of units um, for affordable housing without actually having to increase the number of units um, uh, in, you know, in, through construction or, or um, anything like that. And it's cheaper, it's sustainable um, development and it's you know, a great way to reuse existing um, property. We are um, a very diverse community and um, the, the property is located in, I think we're right, uh, right off of the East Village um, Center uh, area in Amherst. And we would just like to have you know, an integrated um, community and, and the way it is and, and have it stay that way. Um, so that's what our petition is. Thank you very much. Um, so you would be looking for the town to acquire this, for the town to essentially be the, the landlord of this property? We are looking for the town to acquire the property, yes. Um, the town would then be able to uh, hand the property over to a nonprofit organization or the housing authority to then manage. So our expectation is not for the town to manage the property, but to maintain ownership, yes. Okay. Uh, questions or comments from Ms. Boutillier? Mr. Misanti, um, tell us about the, the how this looks for the town and conversations that you've been engaged in on this topic. Yeah, and we, we've had some uh, good preliminary discussions. Uh, and what I have expressed to uh, uh, petitioners and to the property owner, for that matter, the current owner, uh, is a strong desire, I think, on the part of the town to do what we can uh, to preserve as many units on an affordable basis uh, as is possible for all the reasons that Tracy Lee has said. Um, my sense, uh, and th you've identified in the, in the uh, article a number of very uh, potentially promising uh, revenue sources, primarily state uh, sources, uh, none of which are in hand, none of which are, have been applied for yet at least. Um, so my, my, my initial sense on the article is uh, um, the specifics of it are premature. Uh, I can report to the board that uh, based on some initial conversations with the uh, current property owner, um, there's, an, there's an openness to having the, uh, a more detailed discussion about what might be possible, uh, preserving some, at least some number of the units. Um, so I have said that I'm willing to help convene uh, the appropriate staff and others to uh, try to further that conversation. Um, I, and I can see, depending on where this goes, I can see that then being the basis perhaps for some uh, subsequent action, possibly by town meeting, fall or even next spring, um, but I wanted to relay that to the select board. Thank you. Other questions or comments from select board? Mr. Wald. Thank you again for a very, very clear presentation and good homework here. Lots of, lots of good background and relevant issues. I guess part of my question was the detail about the funding. Were you still hoping to get CPA to back this and does that depend on that? Because I know that, you know, they have, as you know, come to the end of their cycle and of course this came up at a late point in their calendar, that's not your fault. But how much depends on CPA then, as far as the, what you're proposing here? Um, I don't think I have that figure. Um, with how much was going to come from CPA. We... What I'm, part, of, part of what I'm asking is, CPA things come to town meeting only if they go through CPA, right? So that's Correct. Right. So we did understand that, yes. Um, and between the time of this happening <laughs> and getting in front of, you know, getting organized and, and reaching out to CPA, um, yes, we, you know, we're here without um, having seen them. So what we're thinking and, and, and looking at is that we would still love to meet with CPA committee, um, and we do not see 
that CPA backing this or supporting supporting us um, does not necessarily need to take away from any of the other projects that CPA has decided to support or is um, pushing forward by bonding um, this project as well as one other project or maybe two other projects that would be uh, make it possible that everything could be supported without taking anything away and denying um, funds to another project. So that's an option that we're looking at. Um, I do know that there aren't concrete. Um, this is, this whole thing with research and everything has really been outside of my area of expertise. Um, so I've tried to do the best that I can do. And really we wanted to put out the possibilities of um, what's there. And the, the funding sources that I've listed here will allow for tenant-based assistance to, um, or tenant-based assistance holders, voucher holders, to actually stay in those units. Um, it makes a difference between whether it's a project-based assistance versus the tenant-based assistance. Um, and it also allows for a uh, mixed income uh, building as well, which is, those are the things that we're looking for. And that was the type of building that we had, whether, you know, it's definitely mixed income. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brewer, then Mr. Hayden. I'm really sorry about the crackling noise. I know that's <laughs> incredibly distracting. I have no idea why Amherst Media is having trouble with that, but I'm sure they'll think of something. Um, right now, CPA was able to go outside its normal funding system, never let it be said that we're just bureaucrats and that we have to do things on a certain schedule because we already discussed the um, emergency fund associated partly with tenants here, which is not a lot of solution, but it's a small solution toward a solution and associated with the previous angle. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. They're coming from different angles of, of our issue. Right, but it's still Echo Village tenants it is, that yes. it is directly benefiting that we voted to that we voted to support that CPA brought forward outside of their usual cycle saying, well, maybe here's some little piece of something we can do to help with this situation. So that is one of the housing recommendations that is coming before town meeting is for that particular, for Family Outreach and Amherst Housing Authority for the Amherst Renters Emergency Fund of 15,000, which this body previously voted to recommend. So they are, uh, clearly CPA is attempting to be sensitive to this. In terms of um, one of the details I don't know about, just, um, and you've done a ton of research, one of the things I don't know about is CPA has, is bringing forth these articles to town meeting. It seems highly unlikely they're bringing a different article forward to town meeting given the town meeting starts on Monday. Is there a possibility, you know, we always talk about making motions within the scope of the article and what you're actually legally allowed to do based on what the warrant says. I believe there would not be, but correct me if I'm wrong, a way to change one of the currently recommended projects that's not recommended for bond authorization to recommend it for bond authorization in hopes of helping, you know, reallocate things at this point. It's how, I mean, they can't make that change at town meeting, can they, based on the warrant as published? No, so the CPA law requires that the only things that can be voted on by town meeting are the recommendations that are brought by the CPA committee. They can, the town meeting can reject or decrease any of those right. recommendations, but it cannot make alternate recommendations. What I was getting at was that if CPA itself wanted to say, oh, as has been mentioned as, as a possibility, just like there are lots of possibilities, well, maybe CPA could put something under bond authorization instead of paying for it directly. What I'm saying is I don't think they can make that decision within this warrant because I think it's too late for them to do that unless we simply rejected it and that particular aspect and then redid it at fall town meeting or something. Correct. Is that correct? They can't just decide, hey, this is a great idea, we should do this and then change it because the warrant is what the warrant is and the rules are what they are. Correct. Ms. Stein is our CPA liaison. Pardon me? I said as our CPA liaison. <laughs> the yes. <way> <laughs> right. But um, what I was wondering is if this turned out to be something that would be beneficial for the town um, in terms of keeping our affordable housing numbers up so that we can stay above 10% because we know that rolling green could lower us precipitously. Um, and 
then would it be possible for a special town meeting within town meeting to have a new article brought forward if that came from CPA and further discussions with you um, about the best way to go forward? I think the timing is very extremely challenging um, and that I think the funding plan for whatever solution if any that's arrived at should follow the planning and not be the first step of the planning and I'm saying that in all due respect to the mm -hmm. people who've been devoting a lot of time and effort to try to brainstorm possible approaches here um, I'm encouraged by the fact that the uh, uh, property owner is open to having a conversation about possible possible approaches that's very far from a guarantee right. on the outcome sure. but um, it puts us in a position to have a more detailed discussion about options and what what is or isn't possible which could then inform I think a future article if such an article was needed Mr. Hayden it's at times like this when I wish Roy was still around um, I, I have a, a slightly different question, and, and I want to thank you for your presentation. It does sort of pull everything together, and, and um, the, the, your handout here, which I hope will be on the website eventually, so people at home can see it as well, um, leads me to a slightly different question than Ms. Stein asked, but it's, I think it's on the right, uh, right, along, the right along the right lines. Um, there are a number of agencies listed here as potential sources for funding, um, HUD, for instance, um, I understand that um, funding uh, grants along these lines sometimes are supported by positive action on the select board's part or town meeting's part. I don't expect an answer right now because it'll take some cogitation, but I'm wondering if there is something that we could do that would indicate appropriately to the appropriate people that the town is is serious about this is committed to it and that if, if CPA and, and maybe maybe not a special special town meeting like we often have is the, is the right mechanism um, I would like to figure out or have people smarter than me figure out how we can send the right message to these people who really will need to be partners in a successful project like this thank you uh, you know, uh, I if, the, if, the, if, if, you know, for example, if the select board as a body said, you know, uh, pursuing every effort to try to preserve as many affordable units as possible is a policy priority of the, of the board and the town, I think that sends a very powerful message to uh, potential funding partners. Thank you. I would just like Go to say I know timing and is a big concern and I definitely want to you know point out that the tenants um, you know as a whole in the very short time I mean we were served our first notice on the 7th of February um, research began you know immediately after the, pet the petition was submitted which was at the deadline at actually um, so from that point to me sitting here, you know, in front of you, um, was the time of the research that we all did. So I understand the concern of, you know, the timing and finding developers and what is that going to look like. But in the very short time of roughly about, a, you know, three weeks to a month, um, a lot of information was found. And, you know, we're more than willing to continue to, you know, work together and at some point would love to be able to then hand it over. Um, but, you know, I just would like to say a lot can be done um, in short time frames as well. And, and we're willing, you know, to assist in, in any and every way that we can. And, of course, this is our homes that, you know, we want to save and, and are hoping to stay in and as well as the town. Um, and we know that you back us and, and support us in that as well. But again, to um, to kind of say, you know, we've we've been able to do quite a bit in a short time, and and are willing to put as much effort as we can to assist um, 
and your efforts as well. Thank you very much. And I think all of your excellent research really um, becomes an impetus to, to trying to find a solution here, and that's very important. Um, I think that um, echoing Mr. Musanti's um, sentiments that this needs more discussion. I think that it's too soon to vote funding for this, and I mean really just stepping back at, at the at first blush, we don't have a willing seller here. We would be acquiring a property from someone who doesn't want to give up their property necessarily unless those conversations continue. So then we're talking about eminent domain. Eminent domain is about the most sacred um, uh, responsibility and authority that a uh, municipality has, and that has to be considered with great discretion. And so, and um, public use and rehabilita rehabilitation, which actually our property doesn't need, so let me go back. Public use and residential um, need and you know, affordable housing is written also into eminent domain. So absolutely, and so and being we a very serious choice. Select this is a very serious very issue. much understands the um, the housing crisis that we're in across Amherst, and it's a it's a crisis at every level, and it's particularly a crisis at the affordability level. Um, it it would be a big hit to lose these units for mm -hmm. these families for sure. Um, and so we want to find a solution to this. Um, I don't. I don't think this is the solution yet. I don't think finding funding for this is the solution right now, but I think that the conversation needs to continue. And uh, Mr. Musanti's point about, um, about sending a strong message, I'm sure that the select board will want to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, we are partners with this in you, um, uh, partners in this with you. <laughs> Mixing up those crazy words. Um, um, but, uh, but personally, I'm not going to be able to support this. I think that maybe uh, my, my thought would be that it gets recommended back, uh, referred back. If we recommended referral back to either the select board or to the housing and sheltering committee, that might be a way to really kind of officially keep this moving forward, um, but uh, without opposing it outright. Because again, it's not, it's not a sense of opposition. It's just the sense that this isn't the right, this isn't the right solution. So anyway, that's where I am. Mr. Walls had his hand raised. Thank you. I'm not sure it's quite essentially the town manager or the petitioner. I think, I hope you hear us. You know, we're very strongly in favor of affordable housing. I think we agree that Amherst has done too little for it for a variety of reasons. There's a real need for it. Uh, so the question is, given that there are issues of timing and financing, and we have this alternative, not alternative, but a different measure on the table from CPA for a rental assistance, mm -hmm. am I correct in understanding, I mean, it's a different approach, obviously, but that that would provide the temporary fix so that no one is actually harmed by the changes that have taken place? In other words, does that buy us enough time to help the renters in their situation so that something like this could be put together uh, with a little more deliberation and, and time? Mr. Musandi? Uh, it buys some time. You know, it's really, in the, you know, the housing court process and eviction processes and all that, it is a whole timeline. Uh, there's various mediation elements uh, embedded within that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it helps temporarily at least, but, but the bigger issue is the long-term preservation of, of affordable units. And just to note from, you know, even if town meeting were to uh, approve this, you know, in a couple of weeks, we know from the Olympia Oaks situation what an incredibly complicated deal it is to put together public funding for affordable housing. I mean, you don't just call them up and then they write you a check. I mean, the, this Olympia Oaks funding situation has been going on for a very long time. So the, whatever the town decided to do with, with this chunk of the money, um, I, I don't think that particularly buys anything at this point. That, that we're just this is the earliest stage of, of trying to figure out a solution, uh, and it's a it, it's a bunch of great information to be working with. But we're not. I don't I don't think it puts us in the position to do anything quickly, Ms. Brewer. I, so following up on that, I have a couple of slightly random things to stitch together here. But looking at the the deadlines page here on the back side, um, of course. You know, we can talk about process all day long, but the reality is, aside from the fact that housing court's incredibly slow, people are being forced out of their homes before the end of the school year. So, I mean, we, we have to recognize that and the incredible stress that that's placing on people. Doesn't mean we can do anything about it, but it's a horrible situation for people to be stuck in. Um, with the, when it mentions here for some of the state housing grants, there's a May 15th deadline. We don't 
have the resources to make that deadline at this point. That's just not going to happen. So I think we should state that very clearly, that no one's going to be putting that in on the town's behalf at this point. That was... And it just have to wait. Excuse me. And the August 2013 prepayment opportunity, while certainly for Rolling Green, while certainly there, and as a very big concern and has been for a number of years and that a number of staff have been working on as well, is not a foregone conclusion. So um, it, it doesn't mean it won't happen, but it's not automatically necessarily going to happen. That does not necessarily help these people right now in the situation, but just to, to clarify around some of those things. Um, what I'm wondering is, um, I think following up on, on what Mr. Wald said, is there a reasonable way <laughs> to make a, an amendment or a motion of some kind that commits some amount of money to make it clear to these other, because we can say, oh, we're all for supporting affordable housing. Well, who cares? There's no application out in the process. We're just like tweeting that to HUD. I mean, that's like not really going anywhere. So I am, um, I'm, is there any way to make a motion associated with this that says we'll take X number of dollars out of free cash and we're going to put it aside for this project so that if something is able to come together, we can do this? I mean, this is very backwards of how we normally do things. We normally have complete packages put together for town meeting. I totally get that. But this is a different situation than just, oh, gee, somebody might sell their conservation land. We, you know, we try to do those in a timely fashion too, but this is people and their livelihoods. So do we know of a way? that a petitioner is planning to come forward or that we could possibly look at this as some piece of money that isn't going to solve the problem, but that will help us in this weird timeline that we're facing to say, okay, well, all right, okay, we all voted, that's $200,000 there, so if you can put together a rest of a package with all these other agencies, then you know you already have that. Or does that simply have to wait? I mean, does that have to wait because it's our usual process, or is there just really no mechanism for doing that? Um, so I don't know exactly the answer to your question. I mean, we can call a town meeting any time a town meeting needs to be called. So, you know, that that, that is always a, um, a possibility for the future. I think it kind of boils down to what the uh, the owner's intentions are. You know, if, if this was a question of, of writing them a check and then you know they people could stay longer or whatever. But I don't think we've anyone has identified that that's the you know he's not just waiting for a check to make this go away. So I'm not sure how you solve that problem with money if that isn't the the the, the solution that, that the uh, that the landowner that, that the property owner is looking for. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is rather than a special town meeting to since we have this warrant article already. To have this warrant, you'd think I'd know this being in town meeting for over 10 years, but that we could make this article be funded somehow, that we could set aside money just like we at other times will say, we're going to apply for this grant and we have made the, town meetings made the authorization that if the grant comes through, we're going to pay this much toward it. And then the money sits there and waits to see if the grant comes through. And if the grant doesn't come through, we don't spend the money. If the grant does come through, we spend the money. Why is this different than that? Be is it because of the way the warrant article is written now? Because it obviously had to be written by a certain deadline. Can't can we do something like that with this very warrant article? Right, make it contingent, um, Mr. Musanti. What do you think? I, I just circle back to my earlier description of uh, a detailed funding plan about preserving affordable units needs to follow the the remainder of the conversation. I, I don't think. Uh, putting funds in up front with no plan, especially given the uh, the flexibility that does exist to uh, conceivably call a special town meeting, you know, at any time. Uh, but the nature of these things is it's not a simple matter. It, it is going to take time, and that's the reality. Deadlines or no deadlines, it's going to take time uh, to move this forward. So I'd like I would just caution against that, Ms. that, that approach. Sorry, I'd like to um, address that couple things. Um, one, we were scheduled to go back into the Housing and Sheltering Committee on the 8th. Um, there were some other questions they were asking in terms of timeline and um, what this would what this would look like. You know, if there was agreement from the town, what is the next step, and you know, what, how that would um, play out. So there, there is, I agree, a lot more research 
and again, you know, understanding it's, you know, just lay people basically trying to to do this. Um, and I spoke with Mr. Masanti earlier um, today and relayed that, you know, I've had quite a few conversations as as well, um, in as part of the research and has spoken to developers on, you know, how do we do this and what's the process like and is this feasible? Is it possible? Um, one of the very difficult things was kind of being the tenant organization and as you're um, identifying, uh, Ms. O'Keefe, is that we don't have a willing seller. Um, and at the, at the time, this hadn't come before um, the town as a whole. Uh, um, so we didn't have a clear specific answer for that, so I didn't want to speak something that we didn't have. My sense and, and what I'm getting from them is that if there was willingness on the part of the town, that there are developers that see this as very attractive um, because one, the state of the building, um, you know, it's it's been kept up, it's great condition, um, this isn't a unit that needs to be rehabbed, um, you know, the revenue's coming in as we speak. It's, it has been all along. So there are benefits to this already, and it is um, appealing to developers. The one piece that wasn't was, you know, which is a huge piece, um, is the either the willingness of the, um, of the owner or the support and willingness of the town. Um, so I think that, and my day got a little crazy and, and away from me, it was information I, I still need to share with Mr. Musanti on, I should, part of it, a, a few of the different um, people I've spoken to. But I f do see that there is the possibility, if, if we're hearing the willingness to, um, to work with this, to look into this as the possibility, one, yes, the determination to preserve affordable housing, but the willingness to look at a way to do this with Echo Village, um, I think that there may be, very well may be, developers that are willing to step forward, which would then bring in pre-development money to cover for the time that these grants and loans would then come into place. Um, it's a lot of ifs, I do understand that, and I, I do hear that as well, but I think that that's more concrete than, than the ifs of a sole person, um, you know, trying to apply for the the grants and the loans. I don't know if that if that helps a, a little bit. Thank you. So I know some from the public is looking to comment. Miss Wilder, if you could come forward, please. And if you could just sort of move to the side a little bit so that she can uh, speak into the mic also. Oh, you could grab another chair. <laughs> and please identify yourself. Uh, Paige Wilder, Precinct Ten. I would just wanna say that this has a lot of momentum and there are a lot of questions and it's falling into place very quickly and it's very likely to pass town meeting. And one of the hangups is the support of town. And I'm, I'm wondering along Alyssa's um, comments if it isn't possible to show that support to make those things fall into, instead of showing this questioning and we're not really sure and could this really happen? I think it's very likely to happen. All of the questionable pieces, um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And if the town said yes, it would be more likely to happen than if the town doesn't say yes. And I think it's a pivotal, pivotal moment in addressing this particular warrant petition and not waiting until later. Um, and I, along those lines, I would like to know if the select board could ask the housing and sheltering committee just to assess whether or not this unit makes sense to, to address the, the low income housing problems the town has. So apart from finances, is this an appropriate way to go? That would be one piece that the town could say, yes, this does look viable, or no, it doesn't. And just lay the money aside for the moment. Everybody's worried about the money. Um, and then if the planning board could ask staff to look at some of the funding cycles that only come up once a year, because to wait for the following year funding cycle is gonna be a real mistake if this does pass town meeting and we can move it forward. And I just wanted to point out that it was very um, expedient of the CPA to pull together the funding source for the rental emergency money, but in reality, that's relocating these people out of Amherst. That money is not to help them stay in Amherst. They can't, there's no place in Amherst to go. 
And so while it's helpful support if they have to leave, we can set aside some money contingent on all these other things happening and it could be support that they get to say. It's a, it's a resource that we have right now that's gonna fall apart as soon as that becomes student housing. That building is not gonna be the resource that it is right now. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. It's just, uh, I think it, I think that the seller is the big question, he's not the seller, it's the owner is the big question mark and how you move anything forward um, when the, 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 this is, that conversation has only kind of begun. And that deadline, sorry, that deadline is not for all of the funding sources. That was one deadline that was coming up and one of the things that is happening behind the scenes is you know, another effort to reach out to find community members that can work on, you know, the application that needs to go through, whether we take it piece by piece and we find people that are taking uh, a portion that they're expert in, um, whether it's the architect or, you know, the contractor. Um, but that's not a deadline that covers blanket for all of the funding sources. I yeah. also wanted that to be clear. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wald, do you have any in the MISTA? Yeah. Given that there are uncertainties on our end, but things are supposedly moving out there in the wider world, is there any reason we have to take a position on this tonight? I mean, is there any harm in uh, coming back to this at one of our pre uh, Not that we know what issues are right now, but we don't know about the facts we said about the road and so on and so forth. Coming back to it uh, at one of those select board meetings before it's not meeting. Because I know the Finance Committee also has not taken a position on this article. Mm -hmm. So that would give us the opportunity to learn more between now and then. Housing and Children Committee, Ms. Brewer, could you tell us what their status is? Of so as the petitioner position? mentioned, they are going to meet. They're having an additional meeting specifically for this purpose. They've already talked to the petitioner twice, but they're just there's a lot going on here. And so they want to talk again on May 8th. And so I said, good, because the select board's going to want to hear from you. And so I'd certainly be amenable to um, deferring a recommendation until after they hear from them as well, particularly given that our Housing and Children committee not only has a number of very dedicated volunteers but also two housing experts associated with it one of which is our director of housing authority and the other is Connie Kruger who has specifically worked on affordable housing in many state programs so they can be valuable resources to this conversation as well um, I'm still I'm still a little unclear I guess because I haven't looked at the finance committee report because we just got it tonight is what would this act warrant article actually do in terms of, you know, I, I, I can read the words, you know, it says three million and we know that it, the number would be taken down a bit by the petitioner. But if we were to approve this, we, we have no plan in place, but what happens if town meeting, in, in their wisdom, even if we said no, town meeting says yes, then what happens? Where does it go? Who works on it? How does it, you know what I'm saying? What does, what does the town meet, given that usually what happens is, I'm thinking mostly of conservation for projects where we say here's some money from Kestrel, here's some money from this grant, here's this, here's that. Boom, we've got it all the pieces, or we don't because it's contingent on one grant, like the park grant. This one's different. I can't think of one that's exactly like this. So if town meeting, there, there are times when town meeting approves something and it's relatively meaningless because it doesn't, do anything it doesn't make it happen in some fashion what does this compel the town to do if this passes i need a better understanding of that as well before i make my recommendation okay so, so the that's town a meeting good question. what they're really choosing so if we uh so if we uh defer a recommendation until after we get more information from housing and sheltering committee and other folks then that could be part of the other information that we get because that's obviously a critical question for town meeting to know that this if this passes that would equal what what mm -hmm. would happen thank you miss time um the finance committee did defer so that's one piece of information the other is that um, the cpa committee often brings forward recommendations for the uh, full town meeting so it doesn't it, it isn't like it's stuck in a once a year cycle I'm not saying and the third thing I wanted to say is the 15,000 that they recommended to aid the Echo Village um, persons who were being uh, evicted uh, was really seed almost seed money to go out and get other funding 
because 15,000 wasn't gonna take them very far, but that's still a whole lot less than the 300,000 that's mentioned in this. Um, that said, I'm perfectly prepared and would like to recommend that we also defer till town meeting because it's obvious that I have a great deal of sympathy, well, I hope it's obvious that I have a lot of sympathy for the inhabitants of, of Echo Village and also with our overall problem of affordable housing, since we are reading the housing report, um, and I have concern about falling behind below the 10%. So there are a lot of reasons why this could be a good thing, but it's obviously gonna take a lot of work and I just don't know if it can be pulled together. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing from all of us is that we're gonna defer um, a position on this. So we will schedule this for a select board meeting to be determined prior to a town meeting date and we'll let you know when that's gonna be. Okay. okay. Is it possible to come away this evening with, um, let me say this, um, is it possible to come away with um, a comment or, you know, of, of support that I could then take as, you know, continuing our research, um, reaching out to developers? Is there something firm that I can take and say, yes, the town is supporting us in, in looking for ways and looking, you know, if we can find the funding, the town is here. We're, again, like I was saying before, I didn't have that. So as much as, you know, this was appealing for a developer to come in, not having the necessary entities behind, um, you know, they were also reluctant. So is there something that, you know, is there support that I can walk away from very clear, yes, the town is here. If, if a developer is willing to come in with, with funding or funding sources, then yes, we can take the next step of, you know, what this is and, and, and planning this out. I think what you're hearing is strong support from the select board for wanting to help you find a solution to this. Um, I don't think we can get too much more specific in what our support would be because we're still talking about so many different balls in the air right now. I want to be clear that that I speak the right thing and, and not misrepresent. I think it, we're so committed to trying to help find a solution to this, but at this point we don't know what that is and, and hopefully it will become clearer next time this comes before us when we have more information. Okay, and one more question. Is there... Um, at this point, a way to continue to work with the town more closely in, in researching this and looking into fundings and, and um, the application or any other? Yes, Ms. Yanti. Yeah, the, the very clear answer to that is yes, and the, the primary people from the town to work with are myself directly and, and Dave Zomek working with staff on, on all the various options. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one more public comment on this. Hi, my name is Catherine Gilbert Espada, and I moved to Amherst 20 years ago with the, um, because of the diversity in the town. My husband and I lived in Boston, and we were told, Amherst is a great place to bring up your child. There's a lot of uh, Latino families. This is the place to be. You know, we were recruited to come out here, and from my um, from my own personal feeling, the, the loss of these families is um, devastating to the other children around the area. Um, and I I really hope that I'm encouraged that you're willing to work with uh, Miss Boutier. <laughs> Sorry, can't say the name. Um, but um, it would be a tragedy to see these families displaced. You know, we keep talking about units and affordability, but there are families with children who have friends in the schools, and it will impact directly our entire community if this doesn't, if we can't find a solution. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we're going to defer our position on this, Ms. Brewer. So just um, a c clarity and then to ask the town manager, assuming I get other select board support for what I'm about to ask him to do. Um, 
and that is one when we say the recommendation is deferred to town meeting um, at, as Ms. O'Keefe mentioned we will definitely you know say when we're going to talk about this next we only have those short meetings right before town meeting as you'll delightfully get to experience as a new town meeting member and um, but we definitely want to hear from the housing and sheltering committee at least a recap of what happened at their meeting which won't happen until the 8th and I wonder if the town manager might do two things one is if um, rather than just because I happen to be their liaison if he would let staff know that um, again that the select board is very much looking forward to the housing and sheltering committees report as to what happened and so that we can talk about this you know sooner rather than later maybe not as soon as Wednesday the 8th but certainly as quickly as they feel like they can pull something together or even if they have to report to us verbally I could actually give up having a paper report if I had to on this one occasion maybe but the other thing I wanted to ask for is that the town manager provide to us the select board and to the housing and sheltering committee meaning Monday-ish um, next week an explanation of what this what this town meeting warrant article actually compels the town or any other entity to do if it passes because again as Ms. O'Keefe referred to you know it's one thing to say yes we support this article but without all those pieces already being in place what would that actually mean it's not as clear and it would be very useful for housing and sheltering to know that before they have their conversation so if he's willing to do it if you guys think it's okay for him to do it I think that'd be great so I think that sounds reasonable are, are those things you can do okay okay good thank you very much thank you for all thank the information you. and thank you for coming in tonight thank you and I can look forward to speaking to you again soon Mr. Masanti thank you thank you very much I don't think we need a formal motion to defer this we'll just do it okay next up we have uh, article 43 the petition for conservation restriction on Coles parcels welcome hello, hello. Don't trip on the mic cord there. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm Jack Hirsch. I live on Flat Hills Road, so I'm an abutter to this um, to this property. On um, on uh, February 22nd, I got a letter from Landmark saying that this proposal had been done. So. Um, we're in a similar situation to Tracy's. We've been running to get things together, um, and that's why we had a very hurried petition article to get on the warrant. Um, so um, I first would like to ask um, the select board, I understand that the Chapter 61 uh, submission has been resubmitted, and I would ask that you take the full 120 days to consider the right of first refusal so that we have time to finish our research and to present all the information on the project. Um, I think the land itself, the land speaks for itself. It's been on the required, um, it's been on the seven year action plan. This first map that I gave you, it's this land up here. And um, you can see on the map that it is in between two wildlife corridors. One is the Cushman Brook one that's uh, striped above it and the other is below it. Um, those are riparian corridors and believe me, animals don't just stay in those two corridors. They uh, hang a left and cross that land and communicate and there are lots of animals that we see all the time in these woods. The, the woods are now used for passive recreation. Um, they're beautiful woods for hiking, a bit tick infested, but that's part of the problem uh, that we have in in New England. Um, we see lots of animals um, there and uh, uh, a wildlife corridor is just one of the of the really valuable things about this land. It also serves as the home of the famous spotted salamanders which is mentioned also in the in the um, open space and land use um, sorry open, open space and recreation plan is one of the unique features in Amherst. Um, we are um, working very hard to find funding sources. We've contacted, um, oh, sorry. We've contacted a number of them. We, we have a meeting with Kestrel on Thursday. I've, um, we've communicated with Mount Grace Trust. We presented to the, the Community Preservation Act Committee and they were very favorably um, inclined. We also presented to the Conservation Committee. 
they were also, our commission, they were also favorably inclined, but because of the rushing nature of this and because of the funding cycles, we're obviously at a disadvantage in that regard. Um, so we are actively looking for uh, partners that will help us do the funding. Um, we have um, every intention to um, contact the state and other agencies as well. I've been playing phone tag with Sam Lovejoy, um, so we're, we're hopeful that we'll get some good news um, soon. Um, the proposed development threatens a woodland that knits together several values that we embrace as critically important to the town of Amherst. It provides recreational opportunities for a wide variety of people. People hike up on the Robert Frost Trail from Amethyst, Amethyst Brook. The trail then cuts through the land in question and heads over to Puffer's Pond. So it provides the connectivity that the um, land use plan um, or the recreation plan uh, stresses. Um, um, its continued protection will help preserve, um, will help Amherst preserve the extraordinary <coughs> historic nature of Cushman Village, which we really haven't gotten into, but it's on the National Register of Historic Places, um, and it's a very tight-knit community. Um, it's one of the oldest village centers, um, and it existed historically um, even before um, white people moved into this area. So um, this is further complicated by something that I don't exactly know how to address. But um, because of the zoning bylaws, you know, as although we are zoned residential outlying, we find that we have no protection whatsoever for a cluster subdivision. So the only, the only way for this project not to go forward would be for the town to exercise its right of first refusal. So if this were a project that the town did a cost analysis of and found out that it was really detrimental for the town for the length of, this, of, of our existence, the town has no protection against it. So in a way, I feel that the zoning has really failed us in this case. There is essentially no special permit required that citizens could have input in, and I don't really see how the town can object to something unless, um, unless we exercise our right of first refusal. Okay. Questions or comments from Mr. Hirsch? Ms. Brewer. Could you clarify that the purpose of this map, which is in town meeting mailing number two, and which a black and white copy of, which is also posted in the select board packet, mm -hmm. um, that this is the outline of the Cushman, is this the national? Historic Register District, is this just the village? Where what What is this representing? Where it says Pine Street, I can't. Well, that would be not possible on this map to see. <laughs> right, right in, right in here. So what's this? I'm sorry. What is the bright blue representing on this map? I'm not sure, it's a square. It's a square, exactly. Yeah. But what square is it? This was in with our new stuff and the black that and white version. That might be Atkins Reservoir of Market Hill. Road. I'm trying to place it and Mr. Zomek's not happening to be here. <laughs> I don't he is know. here. Top of my head. Mr. Zomek, could you help oh, Alyssa uh, identify yeah, a parcel? Help Alyssa out here. <laughs> what is this square? I'm, I'm lost my bearings. I've lost my bearings as to what that represents. Because it's in the town meeting mailing, it should be clear what it represents. There we go. There it is. Can I sneak up to the mic? There? Sure. This isn't Atkins, is it? That's up here. There's the So we appear to be looking at a house lot. Um, that, that's kind of kitty corner, if you will, uh, across from Ruxton Gravel Pit. So um, that's off of Leverett Road. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what the blue represents. I, I'm not familiar with this map. I'm sorry, I haven't seen it before this moment. Right. So right. Um, we have Puffer's Pond. Everyone sees Puffer's Pond. Are we all looking at the same map or not? Yes. Mm -hmm. We 
So we have Puffer's Pond. It's recognizable shape. We then have to the right or to the east of Puffer's Pond is Ruxton Gravel Pit. You can see the small outline and small pond on Ruxton. You then have the railroad tracks going through. Those are the railroad tracks going north, south. And this would be east of the railroad tracks, off of between the railroad tracks and Leverett Road. And there looks like there's a building, perhaps a house on it, on the easternmost portion. So I'm not sure what the blue represents. I've never seen that um, indicated on a map before. Okay. We could research it, but I, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Mr. Wald. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zomer. Okay, uh, so I, here's where I am on this. Um, we just had the um, the discussion of the previous article uh, about affordability in Amherst. We are talking next week about the housing production plan, um, which is in the select board's packet right now in preparation for our next week's meeting. Page one of the executive summary says, a major contributing factor to the affordability gap is that housing growth has not kept up with population growth, including increasing enrollments, as noted in figure one. While the population grew by 24,101 residents, or 176% between 1960 and 2010, housing during the same period increased by only 5,264 units, or 125%. Underline, this is in essence the heart of the town's housing problem. Housing supply has not kept up with the increasing demand, resulting in higher housing prices and residents paying more than they can afford to live in Amherst. So I find us confronted by a housing crisis. Um, there is extraordinary student demand on our housing stock and that is having repercussions in our neighborhoods. It's having repercussions for families at all income levels. Um, and so uh, personally, I need for this, I, I favor this plan going through the process to see if this is part of our solution. It's not the whole solution, but it would take pressure off of the existing housing, which is, um, which as we know is just being converted both in our neighborhoods and, and even because of the economic uh, attractiveness of our affordable uh, what had previously been affordable housing in echo village being turned into student housing this is a demand we cannot uh we cannot stop at this point all we can do is try to better address it i don't know if the landmark proposal is going to be a supportable proposal or not. We just haven't gotten enough details for it. But personally, I'm not willing to support taking that land off the table before we even go through the process of considering whether this is, in fact, a good place among the places that we need to be thinking about, um, about building housing. How will you evaluate the landmark proposal for its, for its merits? I will let it go through the planning board or ZBA process that that is required. That it, I'm not sure if you're very familiar with how those things work, but there's a yeah. there's a ton of public input that goes so into we'll, that. So will you wait for the full 120 days before considering the right of first refusal? Um, I'm not sure. I, I've got to think about what the implications are of that. So when I'm talking about the process, I'm talking about what happens after that, talking about assuming that the town does not exercise its right, which is an early assumption at this point. But you know, so that the public knows uh, the option for right of first refusal is either that we opt not to accept it or that we purchase the property. Um, so purchasing the property doesn't strike me as being in the cards. Maybe you could talk about how what you're proposing here is different than our purchasing the property well, via the right of first refusal. Well, we're proposing to purchase the conservation rights to the property because of the value of the property. And I think if you do a careful cost analysis, you'll find that this kind of development uh, will cost the town in the long run and will create more problems. 
you know, we already have very high dense student housing on the west end of Pine Street. If we add that to the east end of Pine Street, there'll be a party alley all along Pine Street of students walking back and forth, drinking and partying, and it'll, it'll make the problem even worse. I think to go ahead with a development like this, before we've stopped and thought about solutions to the, to the existing problems, seems just wrong-headed to me. I mean, we've, we've tried a number of things to try and resolve student behavior and, and public uh, problems. Uh, one is that UMass is, is providing more police force. I think it's time to look and see how successful that is before we jump into another big development. I think another thing that's really misleading is that um, this upscale, it's called an upscale cottage style student uh, retreat in North Amherst. Um, which is a few miles from the university, so every student there will have a car. And I think that the traffic issues around North Amherst, where the roads are already in sad shape and having 700 additional cars is gonna wear them out a lot faster, not to mention the fire hazards in the wood um, is gonna tax the fire department. I think these are considerations that need to be happen, taken into effect also. Um, I think that the idea that um, uh, rentals close to the university are going to suddenly become vacant because students can go live in the woods in North Amherst at a very high rate. Landmark told us there were going to be $825 per room. They rent per room. They don't rent per cottage. Um, is just ludicrous. I mean, students will always opt to live closer to the university so they can walk or bike rather than have to drive. Uh, most of us consider living closer to where we work as, as an advantage also. So I see this as adding to the problems, not reducing the problems. And I think this is something that the select board needs to consider because once this is built, the land is lost forever, the problems will be here forever. And this is the only opportunity that we have to really consider, is this a development that Amherst wants? It seems to me that development in Amherst has been driven much more by business interests lately. All the conversions to student rentals are, are simply driven by profit. They can make more profit by renting to four to six students in a house, or excuse me, only four students are allowed, but we know <laughs> about that, um, rather than a single family. And the same thing with this development. This land, if you look at the features on one of the maps that I, that I gave you, the topographical features, this land is extremely, extremely hard to develop. The only profitable development that's possible in this land is a huge development like this where they're just gonna level the hill, do all sorts of blasting, bring in you know, water and sewer, and have to convert the whole thing. If this were feasible for single family homes as it's uh, zoned to do, they would have done that years ago. But you know, those aren't, economically feasible. Only a large development like this is possibly economically feasible. Okay, let me get further qu comment from Select Board. Mr. Wald, did you have your hand raised? Oh, yes, Stein. I was wondering um, what Mr. Zomek would have to say about the conservation value and the idea of purchasing a conservation restriction. Okay, Mr. Zomek. Well, again, I, I think I'll preface my comments by saying I think it's a little early um, in the process. Uh, um, as Ms. O'Keefe said, we're learning more and will continue to learn more about this as, as things go along. We don't even have a development proposal uh, for the planning board or the planning staff to consider yet. So I want to put that right out there. Um, the open space and recreation plan, I'm sure, will be discussed at length on the floor of town meeting. Um, happy to briefly talk about that now, and we can talk more about it. The Conservation Commission uh, heard the first proposal from uh, the petitioners, uh, I believe, about a week ago, and um, invited the petitioners back uh, at a subsequent meeting before this is on the floor of town meeting. I believe that was the promise from the Conservation Commission. So again, it's very early in their process, uh, and I think it's a little hard for the Conservation Commission to deal with this again out of the sequence of, of CPAC. They've already made their recommendations to CPAC. 
many, many months ago. And that isn't any fault of the positioners, it's just uh, the chapter uh, process, chapter 61 process has just started. So getting back to the open space and recreation plan, like our master plan, the open space and recreation plan is, is a guide. It is not an absolute document. It's a, it's a fluid and living document. In fact, it's changed over the years um, uh, and will continue to change as we uh, preserve land, as we preserve farmland, as the needs of the town uh, change and, and grow and, and, and are adjusted. Um, in the, the, uh, the 2009 update, this area was identified as a possible forest reserve. Um, I will note, and, and I um, helped uh, and was directly involved with the update of this with my staff, um, that is the only, um, uh, that is the only um, um, section of that particular map, I believe it's map seven, or hold on, let me just clarify that, uh, map eight, I'm sorry, the seven year action plan, um, that is, somewhat tentative. Uh, you'll notice all the other areas are clearly identified. This said possible. The other areas, as you note, are things like Puffer's Pond to uh, Leverett Wildlife Corridor, um, uh, Mount Holyoke Range, Lawrence Swamp. Those are known priority areas. Uh, in previous open space and recreation plans, we hadn't really prioritized that area, um, but it was thought at the time that it was a large block, as the petitioners have identified, a large block of unprotected forest land. So that's why it was referenced as possible. Um, you'll even note that in the, on map eight, uh, part of the uh, possible forest reserve is uh, denoted in, in green solid line with uh, a dotted line to the west of that. And that was even with some staff and, and commission input that you know, it, it was close to a village center and that there might be possible possibilities for uh, other things to happen there. Um, so it, there was, uh, my point is there was a fluid discussion about this area. Um, clearly the petitioners have identified the, um, the longstanding commitment the town has made and the Coles family and, and company has made to um, uh, the, the population of uh, yellow spotted salamanders that are there. Um, Again, clearly that is a, uh, a wonderful educational opportunity. The town is known uh, worldwide for that, the efforts it made back in the 80s to put in those tunnels. Um, uh, what I've heard from, uh, from Cinda Jones and, and, the, and the Coles Company and from Landmark is that you know, they're committed to finding some solution uh, and some way to preserve that land that contains the salamanders. So all of this I think is is a roundabout way of saying, I think there's, there's pieces of information that we have, there's still pieces of information that we need to have. We, we need uh, for the town, the town is in the process of, of considering the chapter 61 uh, resubmittal of that information. Uh, I don't believe we've had an opportunity to fully review that yet. So um, I think all of those uh, things need more input and a little more time. Thank you. Mr. Wong. I, I'm, I can't take a position on the landmark. I don't know if it's Mr. Zomek said, but I'd just like to underscore what the chair said about the housing. I, we all understand the problems of housing, or maybe we don't actually. We understand there's a housing problem, I'll put it differently. And we understand the problems of student behavior. Of course, student drinking outdoors is illegal. There's no open containers. That shouldn't be an issue. They can be arrested for that fine. Uh, but as far as the larger issue goes, you know, People keep expecting the university to provide housing. It's never gonna house all the students. That's magical thinking won't get us very far. Uh, number two, I understand some concerns about large blocks of student housing, but there is something to be said for them if they're managed by an on-site manager and well-developed in providing taxes as opposed to students elsewhere where they're paying no taxes. And the, whatever the, the solution right now, the lack of affordable in the common sense use of the word housing for students, uh, is making predatory landlords buy up ranch houses and old Victorians and split them to apartments. I mean, that, as you said, it's, it's, that's what's happened. The lack of large numbers of housing for the student population is ruining the rest of the housing stock and destroying neighborhoods. We have to deal with that. Uh, 
I guess what I do like about the proposal here, which is nothing but a sketch, is the idea of cluster housing too, which does use space efficiently and is considered sustainable. So I guess I'm not able to judge the particular proposal, but we've seen it happen before, for example, whether it's with another development plan for the town or even the solar and the landfill. Often these things look maximal at the first stage, and through negotiation they're scaled back and protection can be put in place. So I think I'd rather see, as you said, the process run its course to the point where we have enough information to make intelligent judgments. Thank you. Mr. Aiden? Yeah, I hadn't raised my hand yet, but I was oh, thinking out loud. It's okay. Um, no, I just, just one of the, um, the, the um, interesting things, among the many interesting things on this project, is that I, I find it right smack dab in the middle of a number of really big issues that we have to, that, that we have to as a town, have to deal with. Um, housing, uh, meeting the demand for housing is one of them. Um, the need for open space and protection is another. Um, uh, student behavior, yes, that, that's another problem, uh, although I don't know that this is dealing with that. It's, it's certainly going to be part of it. Um, traffic, taxation, um, all of these things really do come together here. Um, I would point out that we've been very successful at saying no to allowing students or the, the, the likelihood of student uh, of, of development that would encourage students to live among us uh, in the past. And this is the first place where it's more difficult to say no. Thank you. Other select board members? Ms. Burr. Um, side note, the select board's not been advised of receipt of the revised package on the 61A and the 120 day clock. We haven't gotten that notice that that come back in so did it it's come back in over the last several days minutes <laughs> right. several minutes okay because that's something that concom will look at on our behalf you know so okay here's my question my question is will concom look at that in a timely enough fashion before the select board makes a decision or will the select board make a decision without having heard from CONCOM? About chapter 61? Yeah. About um, they have to, right. they, they weigh they in for to. both CONCOM so, and planning board. So I'm trying to understand what the timing is given that it's only been a few days, given that obviously everybody's schedules are insane around town meeting, et cetera. If we would have some sense for the petitioners of when that might happen because they're asking, you know, when's the select board get to weigh in on this? So what are our, what's our timeline look like roughly on that? I don't think we have a timeline. I don't think anything substantive can happen, can begin to happen until after town meeting. Um, I think it wouldn't be appropriate for um, any boards to be dealing with this in, in times that the rest of the town is committed to town meeting, so. Okay, so that, that's one question I had. So that understanding is that CONCOM Planning Board weighs in on the right of first refusal. It comes to the select board, so we won't actually deal with this from that standpoint, not as, aside from this particular warrant article, until after town meeting. Okay, point one. Um, and then basically echoing what other people have said. Um, I, I would like to remind us that when we talk about business interests and commercial interests driving development, I would also argue that as a town, we have made choices over many years to conserve a huge amount of land, a huge amount of land. And there is no question whatsoever that by preserving that much land and conservation and open space that we put more pressure on the housing market. So we have also made decisions. They are not simply market-driven decisions associated with this. It's one of the things that makes Amherst so special, but it's also a conscious choice we have made to put a lot of land and conservation and lock it up from housing development. We've talked a little bit about where student housing should be. We talk a lot about where student housing should be. Clearly there are some folks in town who believe that housing should be on campus, period. End of discussion, no more discussion. Um, we like to hope that might happen. Maybe there'll be changes in the law for public-private partnerships. That's not you know, an entirely impossible, but at this point it does feel rather like magical thinking to imagine that any of that will happen. As we continue to be concerned about that and to to, in some cases, take that attitude that the university should deal with it, houses continue to be turned over by predatory owners. And we know that, and that's one of the reasons we're doing the safe and healthy neighborhoods work and the rental registration work, because we aren't just going to wait for something magical out there to save us. I would certainly 
agree with anyone who would say that the master plan would not consider this an optimal location for high density housing. There's no question that the master plan would not consider this an optimal location for all the reasons you've cited. Um, difficulty in developing, the impact on the environment, traffic, et cetera. Yet at the same time, where is my question? We are unwilling to build dedicated student housing anywhere in town has been made entirely clear by the town meeting decisions that have been made up until now. And I am not willing to continue to take that line at this point. I am very comfortable with hearing from what Conservation Commission and Planning Board have to say about our right of first refusal. Depending on where that goes, if, for example, Kestrel Trust jumped forward and said, oh, yes, please assign it to us, maybe there would be reasons we would choose to do that. At this point, I don't believe I would think that was the best idea. I'm not thrilled with this particular development for a number of the reasons that have been brought up. I am very excited about the possibility of additional student housing units viable, safe student housing units that have been designed for that purpose. Um, individual single family homes also come with costs. So even if they were viable to be developed there, educating children in our schools has thus far proven more expensive despite the stress associated with the student population. It's more expensive than dealing with student related expenses. So it's not a simple rubric. So with all those complications in mind, and again, I guess it would be good to you know really for sure what happens if town meeting actually votes to accept this article, I am in no way in favor of this article at this time. Okay, just to clarify a point I made earlier, um, obviously we have no control over the scheduling of Conservation Commission and yeah. Planning Board. Um, the select board wouldn't be taking this up until after until town meeting done. because um, because no matter We're when just they not schedule get it, it done. right? If Even they if they schedule it, it if they schedule it during town meeting, then we still wouldn't be dealing with it for a while. Okay. And, and I can't Thank imagine you. how most of them could do that because um, there, because there's of everything else. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I hope that's what we're okay. doing. Mr. Zoman. Just I just had two quick points. One is um, that as as is our process, and as was our process with the first uh, notice on, on the chapter sixty one through the town manager. Um, town council would review that and so I think that's will be our next step and then uh, what is typical and in, uh, in, in our process is to then um, convey that information to the planning board and the conservation commission through staff and then a meeting could be scheduled so um, that was one point second point just something that Ms. Brewer said before and and I think you're absolutely right and um, I'm sure there will be a, a healthy debate about uh, land preservation uh, at this town meeting and in town meetings um, moving forward. One of the points that I always like to make and clarify um, on, on the protection of, of uh, land in Amherst is the goals and objectives of that preservation. And I think it's re very important to not, um, uh, we often lump the categories together, conserved land, preserved land, I always make it a point to um, tease those apart a little bit. We, we really have three major categories of land preservation. Um, one is for watershed protection, and clearly that's for clean drinking water uh, from our Pelham reservoirs, uh, our, our, our reservoirs, um, uh, and, and our wells in, in Lawrence Swamp. So for groundwater protection, for surface water protection, um, and then for conservation general purposes, and most of that land, if we look at the maps that I'm sure will be uh, featured at town meeting, most of the land that uh, has been preserved for conservation purposes and include our trails, uh, the vast majority of that land is wet or in riverfront and could never be developed and should be, never be developed. And, I, um, but, and the last category is really for active and prime farmland. And that, in effect, is the most developable land we have because it's flat and dry and well-drained by and large. But again, as we look toward the future of, of, of uh, how we're gonna feed our population and the region, I think more and more we're, we're finding and seeing the, um, the uh, incredible uh, uh, foresight that people back in the 1980s, Pete Westover, former select boards, former town meetings had in preserving that farmland for future generations and that prime soil uh, it's only made once, but we can keep farming it in perpetuity. So I always make those distinctions because I think there's a tendency out there to lump them all together and say, oh, well, we've taken them all off the tax roll. And 
what benefit? Well, tremendous benefit to water quality, to um, a farmland and, and feeding people in perpetuity. And yes, some beautiful scenic vistas and some wonderful mountains and view sheds. Um, but anyway, just for clarification, I Thank will you. make those points. That, that's good clarification. I'd, I'd like to add that uh, preserving woodlands helps our planet. I mean, that's certainly something we could tease out of there. Um, I also think that uh, Atkins Reservoir, which is the groundwater uh, or the surface water supply for North Amherst is a mile away. And um, I don't know that the Shutesbury police are going to be patrolling the part in Shutesbury, but certainly the Amherst police are going to have to start patrolling the, the part in Amherst. Uh, students will find that and certainly use it. Cars driving up and down the road are going to pollute the water. Um, this land is all uphill from the vernal pools and where the salamanders breed. All the pollution and everything is going to run down to those, those vernal pools. Um, there have been a number of places throughout the state where they've tried to mitigate that kind of stuff and basically the salamanders have all died off and left. The Natick Mall is the most recent one um, which has no more salamanders. Um, so I think that, that um, preserving this land offers a lot other than um, uh, um, just, you know, lowering the tax rolls. I think that that's one of the reasons why people come to Amherst and live in Amherst is because we're a rural community and we do preserve land like this. And I think that um, building another high density student, you know, development there is going to really destroy historic Cushman Village and it's going to destroy the, you know, the eastern half of North Amherst and uh, will create headaches for the town for years to come. Thank you. Um, so no one wants to destroy anything, that's for sure. Um, uh, but, but everything needs to be looked at in the larger context of, of all of our competing interests. And I really would encourage folks to read the, uh, the housing production plan that is in our packet this week. Um, we, we can't expect to increase affordability, um, save existing and historic housing stock, um, have diversity in our community, um, increase affordability for everyone and house the students like we can't if we keep saying no to all the potential development um, opportunities so the uh, the housing plan uh, makes very clear that um, increasing density in particular in our village centers is really important increasing our housing stock in general is really important if we keep saying no to all of these things there are only so many dials we can turn and it's so a village isn't a village no center. i recognize North that amherst village is quite a right and away. unfortunately we just shot that one down too so we can't keep we can't keep saying no to all of these things excuse me we can't keep saying no to all these things and expect to end up with the um with the diverse, affordable, and um, accommodating community for, for everyone who wants to live here. So, um, so I, I really do feel like this needs to go through the process. The things that you're talking about, um, all of the uh, environmental concerns, we have a fantastic conservation commission. I'm liaison to the conservation commission, so I get to see them at work. Um, all of this gets taken into account. Um, it, if, if this land comes out of chapter, that does not by any means uh, suggest that the developer is going to go in and do whatever they want. Uh, this will go through a long and deliberative process to make sure all of those needs uh, and concerns are addressed as best they can, and that's just at the conservation level. Then it would go to either planning board or ZBA. So there really is a, is a great deal of inputs here to have this um, shaped and mitigated to be as uh, as uh, to, to lower the impacts uh, as best they can and try and create a, something that is positive. And I know it's hard to see it from that perspective from where you are, but, um, but so personally, I, I just can't, circling back, I can't support um, short-circuiting that by, by stepping in and saying, no, we're going to take the consideration of this land for development off the table. Ms. Stein. I'm going to be the odd man out. I can feel it. But I'm going to. I'm not going to um, vote against this. Um, I live on Redgate Lane, and I remember um, what the wildlife was like before they put in just one additional street. Okay, we lost the warblers. We lost the weasel that ran through my yard. Um, it to say that this stretch of forest land 
um, is not worth preserving, just really, especially with the salamanders, um, it's a large stretch of forest land. I think that's well worth preserving. I do think we need housing to, um, and I have halfway through the housing plan, so it's not that I'm, I'm not considering that, but I just don't see this as worth what we're giving up. And I think we are giving up something. And I think you have to really think about the ecology of a situation. Um, and I think that's what I'm doing. I think there are places where we could build. I think infill is a good idea. I think we ought to consider apartment houses. I grew up in an apartment house. I'm not against it. I'm not against the one that went up behind Judy, as though a lot of people thought, oh, that was terrible. I don't feel that way. But I do really think it's like building on prime farmland. I don't believe in that either. I think you do have to think about the future farm supply. But our animals are going to be reduced. And I think we have to really seriously consider that if we build those houses. Um, so that's where I'm at, and I know that people don't agree with me. I am don't for student agree. housing, um, but not there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hayden, um, and then Mr. Wall. Just, just one, one little comment, and you're gonna hear this again from me soon. Um, I would urge you to read the uh, master plan that UMass uh, published last fall. Uh, then there'd be no, and I, I don't have the numbers in my head, but you would then know how many more thousands, and it is thousands, of students will be living somewhere. And either they'll be traveling far or not. I believe the number is 1,500. Th that's, yeah, 1,500 is, is the limit of their expansion plan it, beyond where they are now. It's in the housing. Um, it's in the housing as well. I haven't gotten in that the, um In the study that you'll be reading. Mr. Wall. the numbers, the projections. Yeah, just to, to follow up on the comment about students, this is just a minor point. Uh, I think we've been fairly careful. I hope we have when we talk about the problems of destruction of neighborhood character and climate. Uh, to talk in particular about what happens to the housing stock. We all realize that there have been some problems with student behavior, but I think we also agree, even those who are most critical, that it's a minority of students that cause those bad behaviors. And so it becomes a little bit tiresome sometimes to hear again and again that all students are drunken louts. Uh, the students I know are not. They're well-behaved and responsible. The fraternity we visited, they were very serious caretakers of their property. They were academically serious. They do good social work on behalf of the disabled. So I, th I think maybe we should stop insulting the students, however we find a solution to the problem. Thank you very much. All right, is Select Board ready to make a recommendation on this? Ms. Brewer. Could, could it be clarified for us? I, th I feel like in the past when we have had articles similar to this, that eminent domain is in there because it's part of some standard boilerplate uh, wording as opposed to being something we really truly plan to do since it's been a long time since we did eminent domain. So by saying that we would do this, so if this passes, so is this, you know, we try one of these, that one doesn't work, we try another, like how far are we, com how far is the town compelled to go if town meeting votes for this? My how understanding was that it was, boiler, that it was boilerplate language that was put in there and it was put in there because in some cases um, between a seller and the town, through eminent domain, you can negotiate uh, better with the seller. So it was something more of a negotiating tool than it was a reason that uh, for overtaking land. I've heard that too, but I'm just not entirely clear. Mr. Missanti. Well, the, the, the prospective motion is, is kind of an all of the above. Yeah. So it doesn't <laughs> lock the town into any one of those, but it it would authorize the town to pursue any one of those in the course of you know, proceeding if there was an affirmative vote. So to Ms. Brewer's earlier point about the Echo Village one, um, finding out, uh, getting a town council opinion on exactly what the town might be compelled to do if this were to pass, I think would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to take a position on this? Someone would like to make a motion. 
Ms. Stein probably doesn't want to make the sure, motion. I'll make the motion, <laughs> then I'll vote against it. That's <laughs> all right. I She's can do that. She's very flexible. Sure. I move that the select board um, not recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting article 43 petition purchase conservation restriction parcels 84, 91, and 96 of map 5A. And I made it in the negative because I sensed how the rest of the board was going to vote. Gotcha. Thank you. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? One, abstaining. I just want to say one thing. Certainly. There is up in that area something I have not well, seen near one. my property or anywhere else in town, a little tiny red frog. Thank you. And so when I say I've seen some of the wildlife up there, I really hope we won't chase them all out of town. Thank you. Okay, so to confirm the vote, that is four in favor and one opposed. Is that correct? That is correct. To not okay. recommend. To not recommend. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. Who would like to speak to this at town meeting? I'm not doing this one too. <laughs> I don't think you want me to speak to this one. Mr. Wild, are you interested? <laughs> it's, it's okay. Yeah. You win. <clears throat> pre volunteered him. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. Okay. Um, is anyone here to speak to the uh, Article 44 petition local voting rights? All right, um, so we have three articles that no one is here to speak to. I can, um, I can deal with that one because it's come up before. Right, so we all know what this one is. Yeah, the, the, it's, the, it's, yeah so maybe we don't need the petitioner is what I'm saying. So I'm seeing what the select board's uh, take is on this is okay? Ms. Brewer. So uh, aside from that one, which yeah, we've voted on before in addition mm -hmm. to it being before town meeting many times before. The other items, we don't, have paper on but you know we have what the warrant says maybe what the finance committee book says do we have a sense from um, the warrant review maybe from the town manager if there was a presentation associated with those there because it's kind of funny that we know less than might have happened at the warrant review if there were presentations there I know that people had the opportunity to come here I understand that but I mean not all of us are going to watch the warrant review so right so before um, before we make Mr. Musanti uh, summarize anything he knows about this or doesn't um, I, the alternative is we give the petitioner another chance so he gets oh. one more chance to come in that way we're not kind of mis um, paraphrasing him and um, since we know that we're going to be dealing at least with uh, Article 42 again, we could give the opportunity for 40 and 41 yep, also. Okay. okay. All right. So, but I think uh, it seems that we're good on Article 44 to proceed with that. So this is, this would allow permanent residents who are not actual legal citizens to vote in local elections, only local elections. Um, and it is something that has been done in other states. It has been um, passed with strong support by town meeting multiple times. It then goes to the state legislature where it either fails or doesn't come up for vote. I'm not actually sure what happens there, but it never progresses there. So we do this um, every couple of years to keep it uh, in the uh, legislature's docket for consideration and who knows, one day we might get lucky. Um, anything else about that? No, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting Article 44 petition local voting rights for legal permanent resident non-citizens. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Who would like to speak to that? Ms. Stein? Sure. <laughs> Okay. Unless somebody else would like to. Oh, poor Mr. Hayden is loaded down with like <laughs> all of the operating budget all right, and so all the I will do it. That <laughs> There's is lots of uh, 44. The last time. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I suggest that we also um, put off 27 and 28. This is free cash and stabilization. If the select board were to come, were to want to consider something for Echo Village, um, if there was some plan from how money might be spent from there, it would potentially need to come from free cash or stabilization. So since we haven't finished making determinations on things that need to be funded, I don't think we should consider those articles, which would be a potential funding source, unless people feel differently. Anyone? No? Okay. 
All right, then that draws to a conclusion tonight's consideration of Town Meeting Warren articles. So, Town Manager's report, only half an hour late, <laughs> 25 what? minutes. Um, That's fine. There was nobody here for um, the parking one, so we're postponing that too. 40 and 41 is both Mr. O'Connor. Okay. Correct? Okay. Okay. And we just said 27 and 28, right? Also, right. the Post stabilization okay. fund as well as free cash. Okay. Not just free cash, right? That's fine. All right. Town manager's report. Uh, town manager's report. First, a quick budget update. Um, uh, at the state level, the House of Representatives had uh, completed action on their budget proposal at the uh, late last week. Um, doesn't have quite as much state aid as the governor's original proposal. Uh, so have some. Uh, that process now moves over to the Senate. We expect the Senate Ways and Means Committee to release their budget in mid-May, and the belief is that the Senate will take action on their version of the budget by the end of May. Which leads to June House Senate Conference Committee, a final vote on a legislature budget, which then goes to the governor. Uh, and has 10 days to approve or, or line item veto, which then requires a two thirds vote if the legislature wants to override any particular line item veto. Um, so there's not really anything uh, new uh, since uh, there were some additions. Uh, uh, the budget, but on the margins, um, the, the uh, unrestricted general government aid, there is a more modest proposal that was included in the House portion of the budget, and we'll see what the Senate wants to do. Uh, the second piece of that action is that the House Senate Conference Committee uh, has been named to reconcile differences in their respective versions of the Transportation Infrastructure and Finance Bill, which uh, uh, both House, House and Senate bills contain substantial new dollars for regional transit, including PBTA, uh, and the uh, uh, House and Senate leadership and the full House so far have on record supporting a 50% increase in Chapter 90 money for local roads. Uh, local roads, uh, that would make this program a $300 million a year program from its current $200 million that would bring in about 400,000 in new dollars per year uh, to Amherst. We'd go from a little over 800,000 to a little over 1.2 million. That would directly contribute to our ability to really make serious headway against our transportation road, road repair reconstruction backlog. So uh, we expect uh, the House Senate Conference Committee, and there's a desire on the part of some, at least in the legislature, to try to reconcile that prior to mid-May before the Senate takes up the full budget. And we'll kind of see. So we're, we're following that very, very closely. Thank you. Questions or comments on the state budget situation? I, I just, Stein. I missed the figure on how much it will increase our Chapter 90. Uh, it's approximately 400,000. It is, okay. Yeah. Thank you, that's what I had, but I wasn't sure. And before we move on to other things, do people have any uh, questions or comments about the town manager's FY14 budget proposal uh, in general? That's part of this bullet. All right, very well, move along. Okay. <laughs> uh, update on signage and lighting for the uh, downtown parking machines. So uh, we've been, there's a punch list of open issues. We've been making progress on, on many of them. Two of the key ones remaining are uh, lighting uh, and uh, uh, signage for the machines. Uh, the solution for the lighting basically uh, has evolved. Uh, we're now looking at, uh, and I'm going to butcher this, uh, more of a phone booth sized enclosure for the existing machines um, that provides some protection from the weather which should help the reliability of the machines and also allows us to uh, install lighting directly above the machines. So all the issues about being able to read the screen after, you know, 4.30 on a winter night and things like that, uh, that will be helpful. Uh, that specific proposal 
uh, is being scheduled now for the design review board because there is a there is a downtown uh, streetscape feature uh, these enclosures uh, so we're working with staff to get that promptly scheduled uh, and that will also inform the timeline uh, for the installation um, the signs uh, will be installed uh, directional signs will be uh, installed as part of this phone booth contraption that would surround the machines at, you know, presumably eye level. Ms. Stein. Okay, um, we got to see a preliminary um, direction. Yeah. Yeah, and I had a number of specific comments that I sent in about that. So before that gets finalized, I sure would like to see what they came yes. up with. Sure. Okay. okay, because I really think um, we need to be extraordinarily clear because people do get confused. We don't want to fix it and then have it still be broken. So exactly, <laughs> exactly. new it's signs. Oh wait, and still I used not to helpful. make signs at Mount Holyoke for all kinds of equipment. Mm -hmm. So oh, right. <laughs> I feel strongly about that one, Mr. Wald. We're expecting historically appropriate brick booths, you know, with, with nice architectural molding for those machines, but. <laughs> No, that's not how it works. Sure. But uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear this because occasionally I know all of us get emails and letters and phone calls from, from constituents, and this has been kind of a sore spot. You know, the, the problem with the 2G and the 3G and whether you put in three digits and the lighting and the bad instructions and everything. So I think the public will be very glad to hear that. And I tell them to watch select board. I don't know if they do, but they may get bored by this time. But <laughs> the, you know, the more we can do to communicate with the public, I think, because I've heard people say they just stop using the machines. They go look for meters because they got so frustrated. So it has been an issue. And of course, we're trying to bring people down and make them use these lots. They're not really that hard to use. I don't understand what the, I, I don't understand why the problem is as broad as it is, but. Uh, but I think that the delay is a big part of it. And right. clearly, yes, it, so. it just makes sense that when you can't see them at night, then they're right. impossible Especially, to use. But yeah. beyond that, it's, I don't know. And I've heard feedback, uh, including from students, that they find the machines easier to use, believe it or not. Uh, but they're still a work in progress. And the lighting and the enclosures are kind of fundamentally important as the kind of, we hope, the final step. Uh, let's see, staff recognitions, I uh, want to touch base briefly. Uh, 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 received a very nice letter that was sent to uh, uh, police chief from the Tanbrook Coalition Group, uh, really thanking the Amherst Police and officers Menard uh, and also Marcus Humber for their outreach efforts with some of the neighborhood groups. And it was very nice to see that. Uh, you know, this whole safe and healthy neighborhoods effort and the dialogue and trying to respond to uh, particular concerns expressed about individual, individual properties and the follow through on the part of uh, police, very well appreciated. And that complements some of the positive feedback we heard uh, through safe and healthy neighborhoods work group, for example, on some of the work by uh, code enforcement uh, John Thompson, uh, people like that. So I wanted to, uh, Scott Gallagher, Officer Gallagher is also, was uh, cited as, as uh, doing some, some good work in that area. So I wanted the board to be aware of that. Thank you. Uh, recent and upcoming activity follow up. Uh, um, you know, this past weekend, uh, there were two kind of big, uh, Two biggest occasions, perhaps, were uh, the inauguration of uh, Chancellor Subhaswamy at, at UMass. Uh, a number of us attended, uh, um, and uh, uh, Ms. Brewer and I were both able to go to the uh, uh, Stan Zomack Gala dinner. Uh, uh, Saturday night, there were a couple hundred people there. Uh, salute to Stan's. Uh, over 40 years of service uh, in various municipal positions, but it's over 60 years of service uh, to the greater community on a variety of things, including youth, youth baseball. And it was a, just a wonderful evening. Uh, a lot of great uh, uh, dialogue back and forth, if you can picture it, uh, with, with Stan and the others. And it was just a really nice evening and, and a well-deserved uh, 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 
a salute to all of his work over the years. Uh, today I attended a, one of a series of PVTA Comprehensive Service Analysis Stakeholder Forums. I don't know if there's an acronym for that. Uh, uh, the PVTA is engaged in a system-wide study to look at all of the various bus routes uh, about what's working well, what could be improved upon, what, what areas might there be to uh, uh, enhance service going forward, particularly uh, in the fiscal year beginning in July of 2014. If we get this transportation bill through the legislature, that will generate some new dollars to the regional transit authorities, and some portion of that may be able to be allocated for uh, very targeted service enhancements. So it was good dialogue. It's the first of many. It's about a uh, 10 or 11 month process. Uh, so they're taking all kinds of impact uh, input. Uh, there is a, and I'll, we'll get this up on the town website, there is an online survey that the uh, PBTA is doing with the help of their consulting firm on this effort, which is an opportunity for riders and non-riders to offer direct feedback. All of that will be uh, documented and be the basis for some preliminary recommendations that we expect to see in the early fall and there'll be other opportunities for more public forums. Um, this positions the PVTA to be in the forefront of one of the first regional transit agencies to complete a comprehensive service analysis which puts us in a good position a year from now to make some decisions about what to do. And so many of us were there, and we weren't shy about some of the Amherst strengths and some of the Amherst needs in terms of service. Questions or comments about that? Uh, so any expectations on when that survey would go on the website? I believe it's already posted, and I will get that information uh, to you. And you know, part of our task at the community level is to help spread the word yeah. that that's, that's a, a really good way to do provide feedback. Terrific, thank you. I, I, Ms. Brewer. I'm coughing over here, sorry. I was just wondering about the, um, right, what our <clears> responsibility <throat> was and what we might take on. I mean, because we don't have anything else to do, I know. But in terms of helping to spread the word, because I know that um, an individual that attended that today indicated that they were concerned that there wasn't enough outreach to riders. And I thought, well, I don't know what outreach was done. I mean, did PBTA put stuff on the buses? Do they? I, mean, I assume they have lots of options for ways that they can reach out. And I appreciate that, you know, we have right. a great town website and we can do that. But I presume they're doing those things. So it's kind of strange for me to hear that from somebody, but maybe they just didn't see the. I think the, the other thing to remember is that they're at the beginning of this project. Okay. So, uh, uh, presumably when there's a number of very specific suggested options that are kind of formulated, that by its nature will generate right. all kinds of reaction and feedback when there's more tangible. Uh, but you know, our collective job is to help spread the word. We had uh, uh, Richard Fine was there today, for example, from Public Transportation Bicycle Committee. Uh, we had Stavros was represented, uh, some of the senior uh, Council on Aging reps from area communities were there. A number of students were there, including student government, uh, some leaders in student government. So uh, That's great. we're at the beginning, and uh, we can help spread the word. Great. There'll also be hard copy uh, surveys available, too. That was also a request that was made, because not everyone is, uh, you know, plugged into the cyber world. Great. Thank you. That's that's all I have. You were going to mention about um, after town meeting. One of oh, the yeah, right, right, right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. There is life after town meeting. Uh, the what? Late May, I believe that would be. <laughs> uh, Aren't we the, uh, Yeah, it's my intention. We're, we're continuing to work with staff on Rolling Green in uh, the... Uh, uh, preservation of affordable units there and uh, I'm working with staff in a, be in a position to give you a status report uh, I think at one of your June meetings thank you very much questions or comments from Mr. Busanti about these or other things 
All right, then, member reports, liaison and representative reports. Have you noticed how frequently we're meeting lately? Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so, anything really important happened in the last seven days? <laughs> Ms. Stein. Well, uh, these are things we did together. Um, let's see, I know Alyssa and Stephanie, I think, were with me at the, um, student SRO, I guess, student, I don't know what the acronym is. We have the program. Oh, see, she even brought it. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, this was a very nice reception that was held in the student union um, with the members of the student government. And they um, then treated us to a tour of the student union and showed us the cramped offices and the deteriorating conditions. Um, and then we all came down to the um, ballroom where we had uh, were present for the Sammy Awards, which was very nice because two of the people with whom I'd had a deep conversation actually got awards that night. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Aviv Celine and Garrett Gowan. Um, John, were you there? Am I leaving yeah. you out? I'm yep. sorry. That's okay. Chief Nelson also was there. Huh? Chief Nelson, Chief also, Nelson was there. was also there. We're yes. just talking about our awesome table. You yes. know, like, <laughs> we are the awesome crew. Um, so let's see. And then um, we all went to OPIB, um, to the OPIB presentation, which was on Thursday. and got a feeling for what's involved um, with funding uh, <coughs> other post-employment benefits, which primarily are health care. And I don't know how the rest of you felt, but I felt as a scientist, there are too darn many variables. You don't know how much interest is going to be. You don't know how much health insurance is going to go up. So you're kind of pulling your hair out, trying to figure out um, what we should do, and I think it's sort of unfair that Standard & Poor's holds us against us if we don't do anything. <laughs> so it's, it's very difficult, um, and I think we're, we're, doing, we're leaning in the right direction. And uh, then the other thing was that on Saturday there was the inauguration, and that was very lovely. Um, and then that day was for change, Stephanie Ciccarello, but beautiful weather. Mm -hmm. um, many a sustainability uh, festival has been held in the pouring rain with dismal attendance, and this was exactly the opposite. So um, I thought that was really very nice to see. Um, and many, many of you did all of those things. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from Ms. Stein? Ms. Brewer. I was just going to mention two quick things about the Sammies. This is going to go in that mythical file I'm going to put in the office someday. Like, if we ever wanted to go look at it, because how am I supposed to keep track of it? But, you know, it's really quite cool. It's seven years old. This was their seventh year, Center for Student Development. My husband, who works at UMass for the last 15 years, never heard of it. So that's why we didn't hear of it, you know, because not everybody knows what's going on. So it was really great that they invited us and included us, that Chief Nelson could come, just like I was really pleased to see that several staff members also came to the inauguration, because, you know, you're giving up another Saturday to show support of something, but you, you want to be part of it, you know, this new, exciting, era that's coming forward. And as you probably saw in the newspaper, Stan Rosenberg got Swami to promise 10 years. <laughs> so I don't know how he can hold him to that exactly, but 10 years is exciting. I will also mention that just as, you know, we make Ms. O'Keefe go to bazillions of things, but I want you to know that I went to the football performance groundbreaking. I didn't know a soul there except Diane Letterman. And I still don't understand why we're doing that. But the reality is, they had a nice ceremony. They had nice weather for their shovels. And, you know, someday some games will come back to town, which is only a good thing, as Stan Rosenberg pointed out. So we go to lots of things because we try and maintain these connections. Sometimes they seem a little more fruitful than others. We try. Thank you. Questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? Uh, well, I just wanted to add 
one thing about the Sammies and then one thing about the inauguration, which is a bit of a grouch, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, the Sammies, uh, it turns out, I must have been at the very first Sammy uh, Awards because as soon as we walked in and I saw the crystal plaques all up at the I been here, done that, <laughs> but I'm glad to be back. My grouch um, was at the inauguration, which was very beautiful and tasteful, et cetera, was that UMass is part of the five colleges, and I felt it would have been appropriate as they introduced many people to introduce the presidents of the other four institutions. Um, I, I really was unhappy that that UMass, as a participant in the larger community, um, did not make that recognition clear. So um, I'm sure Chancellor Stupaswamy is not going to like me very much, but I I just was sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Other member reports? Anyone, Mr. Wald? Last week, as you recall, we voted to uh, create a study committee for the Lincoln Sunset District, and at the meeting of the Dickinson Historic District Commission this afternoon, uh, Mr. Tucker and I made some presentations about planning principles and permitting bodies and things like that, and then at the end of the meeting, the body voted to uh, request appointment of a separate committee. So we can go forward with that now, Great. as Thank with you. the North Amherst Committee. Excellent. Thank you. So that was the thing that we, we were just slightly out of yeah. sequence on, but wanted to uh, dot all our I's and cross all our T's. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hayden, anything? No. Um, the only thing I would add is, uh, uh, so yes, I was at almost all the things that were just mentioned. Um, I also um, attended for Disability Awareness Week the um, the movie Shooting Beauty oh, that they did in Mahar Auditorium, and that was really terrific. And they had the director there live. They thought he was going to come in via Skype, but um, but he was in New Hampshire, so he just drove down. And uh, so uh, so that was great. It was really it was a fascinating movie um, that took place in the greater Boston area. In fact, most of it was filmed in the 90s, um, and it was about um, folks in a cerebral palsy. Um, like a day center and this this woman who was an artist brought cameras to them still cameras and video cameras and and they made art you know they kind of showed their life and perspective on things and uh and it was incredibly empowering for them and it was just a it was a pretty amazing movie and uh the, the project has kind of spread to um different places all over um who are who are copying it and so it was quite great and uh it was really great the the questions it was um I think it was all students in the audience. I think my husband and I were the only people over like 22. Um, but uh, it was great to hear their their questions to the director about the experience of creating it and uh, all this. This is the fraternity that um, Mr. Wald had mentioned earlier, the ones that many of us went to their house for dinner, that they build the wheelchair ramps and things like that, uh, Pi Kappa Phi. Uh, so disability awareness and disability, kind of the celebration of abilities is, is a big thing for them. So they um, had put on this Disability Awareness Week and, and hosted the screening. So more good work by them. Ms. Stein. I'm going to mention that the Attorney General's office did come out with their response to the quorum issue, which you may remember was whether um, less than a majority of um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, what's Less the word? than a simple majority could be a, a si well, designated. Right. As if you had a, a, a committee that, say, it had nine people, but there were two vacancies, um, would the majority still be five, which it would be if it had a total full complement of serving people, or could it be four because the actual serving people were seven? Um, they said that it has to be five, okay, out of nine, a majority of um, people that would be a full complement for that committee, um, unless the um, authoritative bodies had designated that less than that number could constitute a quorum. So, for example, Kanagasaki Sister City Committee 
um, can have a large number of people, but five will constitute a quorum because their charge says so. Mm -hmm. So if a committee felt they were being very hampered by not having, being able to reach a quorum, then they could consider amending a charge and bringing it to the select board or to town meeting, for example. Thank you. Good to finally have an answer on that. Right. Ms. Brewer. To follow up on that, and, and I guess I'm going to be a pain and ask the town manager, next time you're talking to somebody from the MMA, because it just falls on deaf ears when I bring it up, evidently I've made myself annoying, is <laughs> that me. this is in the beacon, the thing that people with dial-up read, not the thing that people with internet access read. This isn't even on the MMA website, generally. Most of these articles aren't on the MMA website. They don't even copy them over. and. Um, I think you can find this, but they don't announce it. The attorney general doesn't announce it. It's just like, if you happen to randomly notice that it's in a paper publication, then you can be told this. It's very frustrating. I mean, we do such an awesome job in town. I don't expect everybody to be as amazing as Amherst, but they have, and even with the limitations that the state, the Commonwealth has told us, you know, they have all these screwy ways that their website's built so that they can't do certain RSS feeds, blah, 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 fine. But somehow, there has to be a way to say, you know that quorum question? There's been a new thing published. Boom, go look at it. Okay. And we're just Noted. not getting it. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Thanks. Anything else? Member reports. All right, uh, chair's report. I don't know any chair's report. Um, we meet again Monday, the 6th. We will be at the auditorium until future, or at the middle school rather, until future notice. <laughs> um, who knows Who knows how long town meeting will last. Um, during town meeting, we will talk about what our schedule is after that. Um, so six o'clock in that band room, music room, whatever it's called. And uh, anything else we need to mention or refer to before that time? Uh, Mr. Hayden. I would move to adjourn then. And without objection, Second. this meeting adjourns at 9.23. Thank you very much. <laughs>